Shall we start? Yeah. Okay. Can you start already. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let's start off. Right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, I, I am Dr. K. Y. Chan, uh, immediate past president of the Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine uh, president, and uh, uh, I'm a uh, going to say a few words before we start off. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, meeting uh, and webinar, which is uh, very productive, hopefully. We've got about 400 odd participants who have signed up, and I hope you will all find this very useful. And just a brief word about what MASM is all about. Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine was founded in 1973. Uh, we are a collection of uh, uh, physicians, scientists, uh, sports uh, uh, coaches and various disciplines and physiotherapists uh, all involved in um, with an interest of uh, promoting sports and medicine, sports medicine in particular, uh, to take care of our athletes and for uh, participants into sports. And we'd like to invite you guys to join our uh, membership as well. And after this conference or webinar, please uh, look up our website and we hope you guys will sign up as there will be more and more uh, sort of webinars to educate people on uh, aspect, various aspects of sports medicine and sports science. So uh, we will kick off with this uh, webinar today on uh, soft tissue, tendons and ligament injuries. And now there'll be three presenters, all very, very experienced. And I hope you guys will gain a lot from it. And please enjoy the uh, meeting. And please do ask lots of questions. If you can't get through on the uh, uh, audio system, please post your questions in the chat. And also, we would also like uh, to get our uh, panelists and, and uh, speakers to reply. If we don't have all the time to do it today, then we might do it as a uh, online reply later on after the program. So without further ado, I'll hand over to our moderator, Dr. Alston. Chung, he is our vice president of the uh, MASM, uh, and uh, we'd like to like him to conduct the uh, and moderate the session. Thank you very much. Alston. Can you hear me, Alston? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can take over from from this. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, the Malaysian Association and of Sport Medicine's webinar, which is uh, in collaboration with BTL Industrial Malaysia. We are very honored to have um, uh, all the audience and also our distinguished guest speaker today, and also uh, the representative from uh, BTL Industrial Malaysia. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself. I'm uh, the moderator for the webinar. I'm uh, Elston Chong. I'm the sport physician in University Malaya Medical Center. And together with us, we have uh, just now, uh, Dr. Chan already introduced. Uh, he is the uh, vice president of uh, Malaysia Association of Sport Medicine. We also have uh, uh, Prof. Mahin here, which is, which is also... Uh, hello, Prof. Mahin, how are you? Uh, he's also the Vice President uh, of our Malaysian Association of Sport Medicine. And then for our distinguished guest speaker, we have the first one, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Abdul Halim Bin Mokhtar. Uh, Prof. Halim is the President of the um, MSM. He is also the uh, Consultant Sport Physician practicing in UMC and also UMSC. He is also currently holding the post of director uh, for the sport medicine, so, sorry, director of a center for sport and exercise science in University of Malay, Malay, uh, Malaya. So, um, Prof. Halim has a vast experience in teaching and research, and uh, he actually expert in uh, sport medicines, especially in treating sport injuries and also sport coverage. Okay. Um, and together, the second speaker, we, we have uh, here is um, Mr. Sela Ramana Rajo, or we call Ram. 
Uh, Ram is a uh, sports physiotherapist uh, with a uh, Selangor Football Club. Uh, Ram has 11 years of experience in uh, sports physiotherapies, uh, treating Malaysian top uh, footballer in uh, various uh, famous local football clubs. Okay, and not to forget, we have uh, two representative from BTL Industrial Malaysia. We have the first one, director of uh, BTL Industrial Malaysia, Ms. Magis Morgan, and also the BTL Products Specialist, uh, Ms. Andre. Okay. So, um, we doubt, for, uh, just a gender reminder, um, all the participants is actually uh, being mute and uh, the video uh, is not being shown. So if you have any questions throughout the uh, webinar, please type your question in the chat, chat group at the site so that we will try our best to answer during the Q&A sessions. And then um, please stay until the whole webinar finish for MMA uh, medical practitioner, there will be uh, a QR code uh, displayed at the end of the sessions that uh, for you to claim the CPD points. Okay, so um, without further ado, let us start with the uh, talks, the lectures from our first speaker. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Prof Halim to give the lectures uh, regarding overview of uh, muscles and tendon injury. Welcome, Prof. Yeah, Prof, you, please welcome. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chung. Allow me a while for me to set things up. Uh, Chung, can I double check with you? Are you receiving this? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chan, the uh, immediate past president of the Asian Association of Sports Medicine. Uh, Dr. Alston Chong, uh, colleagues, Mr. Ram, uh, Prof. Mahin, uh, Mr. Ram, and Audrey, as well as my guests. Thank you very much for joining, uh, for joining me in this platform to actually uh, present to our audience, listening to our, our honorable um, guests and audience, and, and to share some of our uh, knowledge as well as to, uh, to demonstrate some new things, like especially from the BTL side, yeah? So I'm gonna talk about uh, an overview of muscle and tendon injury. Right, um, 10 to 55% of all acute sports injuries uh, are actually in uh, are, are muscle and tendon injuries. And they, they, uh, 10 or 15% of all acute sports injuries in high demand sports are actually, sorry, muscle and tendon injuries, yeah? And uh, mechanism-wise, uh, commonly we, we divide them into two. For uh, contact sport, it's usually trauma, direct trauma. Uh, sorry, that's the second one. But the first one, which is non-contact sports, this is usually due to a centric phase of muscle contraction, which actually cause uh, uh, you know, uh, extra or overzealous uh, tensile strength, which actually lead, uh, leads to uh, to break in the tendon or into the muscles as well. And the most frequently injured uh, muscle would be uh, muscles with a great percentage of type 2 fibers. Uh, and th this is the fast switch fibers. Uh, so if you talk about, for example, uh, between quadriceps and calf, so quadriceps is actually more likely because it has more uh, type 2 fibers. Uh, and, uh, and those with pennant architecture, so when we talk about muscle uh, architecture, uh, we have pennant and the non pennant one. The pennant uh, usually talks about uh, the non, uh, uh, let's just say, non linear one. If you can see that in the picture here, for example, uh, the line of, uh, of uh, digitation or connection is actually slanting rather than going straight upwards. If it's straight upwards, that would be the normal non pennant. But when they actually cross like this, then this, these are the pennant. Uh, architecture and these are more commonly uh, more of the common muscles which are injured. So the common examples would be um, when your quadriceps, hamstring, uh, your deltoid, yeah. And uh, those muscles and tendons that crosses uh, two joints, uh, for example, the hamstrings, flexus femoris, and medial head of gastrocnemius, yeah, actually both heads. 
but the more common one is, is the medial head of gastric means. Okay. Um, and the main site of injury is the musculotendinous junction. So, and I will actually explain and elaborate a little bit about this one later. Uh, age uh, predisposes to muscle injuries. Uh, for example, the triceps serrae, which is actually where, you know, the, uh, where your gastro, uh, your, uh, uh, your gastro and, uh, the, and the common, ten, common tendon for the uh, uh, what, uh, gastro uh, plantaris and what's the other one? Um, they are all actually inserting to the uh, Achilles tendon and it is uh, more commonly uh, occurring in the age of, uh, in, in, in people at age of 40 and above. And uh, it is actually related to degeneration. And uh, the in injuries incidence are variable with sports. Uh, it seems to have 11% in rugby, 16% in running sports, 18% in basketball. And in these sports, hamstring, quadriceps, and adductor muscles are the most frequently affected. Right, and in one study that looks at uh, professional soccer, uh, extra and, and colleagues uh, in 2011, they studied 2,299 players and they found that uh, 0 0.6, uh, sorry, they found 2,900 muscle injuries and they also found that 0 0.6 muscle injury incidence uh, per session per player, which means that in the one season, there's the chances for someone to get uh, muscle injuries uh, you know, this, at least one uh, or less than one of his injuries is actually due to muscle, uh, muscle injury. Um, 15 injuries uh, per, size, per season per team. And we are talking about 25 players per team, which means that one team in a season would ha probably have a mu muscle injury, about 15 muscle injuries. And the muscle injuries uh, uh, constitute of 31% uh, of all injuries. And they also constitute of 27% of the total injury absence, which means that's uh, it's probably one of the major uh, injuries uh, attained by the uh, football players. And 90% of them, or more than 90%, uh, are actually from the hamstring, uh, the adductors, quadriceps, and even calf muscles. 16% 16 were re-injuries, and re-injuries uh, also result in significant longer injury absence. And also they found that the injury rate increased with age. So if you look at it, that uh, it's quite common in football. And uh, as you can see there, they are also the, one of the main contributors to absence from training or from uh, games. Now when it comes to make mechanism of injury, so uh, in an indirect mechanism, which is the more common one, uh, it's, which is non-contact, uh, in non-contact sports, uh, or in non-contact mechanism, so the main location is actually at the uh, musculotendinous junction or end of the muscle belly. So yeah. And uh, the likely cause is uh, because of the uh, eccentric contraction, which generates greater force than concentric or asymmetric contractions during the game, which, uh, you know, which uh, surpass the threshold of the tensile strength and they, can, they break the uh, tendons or the, the muscles. Right, um, so there's been some um, possible, possibly, or some postulation about why Muscular tendinous junction is the more likely place for uh, injury, uh, main, mainly probably because of the it is the main site of the transmission from muscle of force, yeah, sorry, of force from muscle to tendon, and there there is an increased contact area uh, with the tendon via deep interdigitations, uh, and this actually resists a contraction, so it absorbs the force and translates the force from the muscle to the tendon, yeah? And then there, there will be a lot of actually um, force to take on uh, from the muscle and sometimes they break there. Also, uh, the interdigitations transmit the force of muscle contraction to the tendon fibers in a tangential direction. Remember that I showed you the pain uh, uh, picture, which means that uh, they are also not directly or not, uh, not linearly uh, inserted to the uh, tendon. So when they are actually a bit slanted, uh, then 
there'll be what I call um, uh, a, a tangential direction of uh, transmission. Okay, and this uh, would this all actually impose higher risk for uh, injury. A little bit on the tendon injuries, actually, we've got quite a number of things about tendon injuries, but just one study on uh, on uh, on the valence of it in football. Uh, they found that tendon injuries in football, uh, patellar tendon is, you know, it's uh, it's there. It's less common than muscle injury, uh, and 60% of them. Uh, actually, mild type of injury means the absence uh, from training is just one week or less. However, it's all, it has a high recurrence rate, so about 22%. That is higher than the muscle injuries that we, fought, we saw just now, which was about uh, 16%. Right. Um, what are the risk factors for muscle and tendon injury? There had been quite a number of studies on this one. But we, I kind of actually uh, summarized them uh, based on one review. Uh, one, for example, uh, uh, they actually, uh, this particular review, break them into modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. In modifiable risk factors, uh, that includes shortened optimum muscle length. Uh, a little bit on this one is that when you uh, want to generate force, you should have what we call, you should do it at a, that optimal muscle length. For example, if you are doing bicep skill, you know you, the best of one of the best actually angle would be this one, it's rather than full extension or full flexion. So um, uh, when you have actually uh, uh, when you are actually playing and you are actually trying to actually run, um, um, uh, or you don't have enough strength, for example, uh, this particular. Uh, um, at this particular optimum muscle length, the short term optimal muscle length, which is actually predispose you to uh, muscle tendon injury. Lack of muscle flexibility has been studied uh, and has been shown to actually contribute to this. Strength imbalance as well, insufficient warm up and fatigue. Okay, on uh, low back injury, uh, among others, they say low back pain can cause increased hamstring tension, and that actually contributes to the uh, to the uh, injury risk as well. Uh, poor lumbar po posture, uh, and there is a study that said that, that actually pointed out that increased lumbar lordosis increase the risk of muscle tendon injury, especially in hamstring. Yeah? Uh, increased muscle neural tension, and this one may happen in someone with back pain, for example, and uh, one particular study actually found that uh, with someone who's complaining of uh, chronic low back pain, they have increased tension of the hamstring muscle. And this all seems to actually uh, uh, the modifiable risk uh, to its uh, hamstring strain in particular, but muscle tendon injury in general. Uh, just to let you know that despite me telling you all this, the evidence is not so great for this as well. So uh, we need to actually take it uh, like maybe it's not just one factor. Maybe it's actually a combination of many factors. So uh, as we read this, we need to digest uh, what, uh, what does what do all this means? So these are the non-modifiable uh, risk factors, uh, muscle compositions, and this actually uh, comes to the more fast twitch. And I mean, uh, if you have bone fast twitch fibers, the higher risk for you to get muscle tendon injury. This is as what I mentioned earlier, that type uh, of uh, muscle fibers can actually uh, alter the uh, risk uh, or the incidence of uh, you know, of uh, muscle tendon injury. Uh, the age we have actually discussed, race, they, some uh, studies have actually found some uh, connection between race as well as the uh, race for muscle tendon injury. For example, in Australia, Aborigines has high risk, African and Caribbean descent have higher risk than Caucasian. Uh, but the, um, the discussion or the, uh, uh, the, the postulation is that perhaps race here means that uh, the results in actually the fiber distribution, meaning that it comes back to maybe some of these have more fast twitch rather than the slow twitch, hence um, actually putting them at high risk. Okay, and the last one, which is the previous injuries, uh, this is actually the most evident, uh, where if you have had previous injury before, then the likeliness for you to get another injury is actually increased. And as far as uh, the literature have actually uh, come out with this previous injury is one of the uh, strongest uh, risk factors 
for another uh, uh, muscle or tendon injury. And uh, interestingly, there's a study by uh, uh, by Ribeiro Alvarez uh, who, who noted that uh, the football players, whether they are professional or the under 20, they are at multiple, they have multiple risk factors for sustaining uh, hamstring uh, strain. And this is interesting, as that means football players are at risk, even, even before we start, or before they even talk about you know, who we should say that you, if you play, play football, you are actually at higher risk already. Um, and these are several uh, specific issues that I would like to highlight, things that we know from the literature. For example, a proximal lesion of hamstring and rectus families have a worse prognosis than if it's from the middle or distal muscle injury. Meaning that uh, if, um, if someone comes to you with hamstring injury and he, comes, he, he has actually a proximal lesion, that actually has poor prognosis compared to the one who comes with middle or distal uh, hamstring injury. Uh, and for triceps array, uh, the distal one as worse prognosis than the proximal one. And then we have the tendinitis versus tendinosis issue, uh, things that we uh, have been actually um, highlighting of, of actually gain uh, and garnered interest uh, many of many of us. Um, now, there's, uh, we are commonly actually being bathed with this tendinopathy, tendinitis, tendinosis, and sometimes per, per, uh, paratendinitis, and sometimes um, this uh, nomenclature uh, or terminologies do get mixed up. Right, um, so the main thing is all of them will probably give you pain, swelling, and functional impairment, and you all attribute this to the tendon. So tendinopathy alone means actually a disease of the tendon. But uh, what we know is that tendinopathy, uh, although, yeah, tendinopathy can be acute or chronic, but the tendinosis, the tendinitis and tendinosis, they've got a different, uh, uh, for example, sorry, if different time frame in developing them. Okay, um, tendinopathy may be acute, but most cases result from overuse, and that is actually comes to tendinosis. And cumulative microtrauma that leads to degenerative process within the tendon that is slow, um, typically measured in months to heal. Okay, and also because of the tendon, there are lack or relatively lack of vasculature, and there's also a slow rate of tissue turnover uh, that actually predispose them to uh, tendon injury, which is the tendinopathy. And uh, sports and manual labor are the most common cause, uh, com yeah, contributing factors to tendinopathy. And just be alert as well that obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol are all associated factors for tendon injury. Medications, particularly <clears throat> fluoroquinolones and statins and even steroids, which if you inject intratendinously, have been implicated in tendon rupture. So just to highlight you a few things that sometimes we are just so much into the sports or the loads, right? we forget about other things which could have actually contribute to the muscle, sorry, the tendon injury. This is from goal uh, 2020. And uh, just to show the normal tendon versus tendinosis on the left. So for example, in, in the normal tendon is actually tightly packed with collagen fibers, organized in linear pattern, which you see on the left, with relatively few cells present. And tendinosis on the right uh, has a disorganized pattern with increased cellularity, cellularity and mucoid uh, ground substance. I think you can even see microscopically uh, that they are actually very much different, yeah? Uh, tendinitis is usually, um, is the acute form of the uh, tendinopathy. Uh, and it's actually about 33% of all the tendon disorders. Uh, so the rest are actually more so of the tendinosis. Uh, they usually come to us with acute onset of pain and swelling. And they are, there's usually a history of um, doing some new activity or something and or something which you are not, un, uh, not accustomed with. For example, um, for, you have not actually done your gym training, uh, lifting weights and all that. So suddenly today 
you decide to go and do that, and then you comes with a complaint of tendon pain. So that likely is actually a tendonitis. Uh, whereas tendinosis is a degenerative condition, degenerative condition which is induced by chronic overuse, and these are the typical uh, condition. This is the typical condition uh, encountered in athletes and laborers. They are generally non-inflammatory, but there can be mild inflammation on this. All right, uh, we've gone through the histology. Uh, one thing about tenosis is they are not always symptomatic. And if they are symptomatic, it's possibly from the neural origin, meaning that uh, one of the things about uh, tenosis is that there's actually increased growth of nerves. And you can see in my previous uh, statement there, so actually there's increase of nerves and vessels. And that sometimes can give you the neural, uh, the neurogenic uh, pain, derived pain. Yeah? Uh, that is unlike, I, that's in comparison to the tendonitis, that is actually the tendon or the structure around the tendon itself. So um, these are the, the common tendons which are affected include the Achilles, patella, supraspinatus, and the common extensor tendon of the lateral elbow. Uh, lower extremity tendinosis is more common than the upper extremity tendinosis. Uh, and lower extremity tendinosis is more common in athletes, while the upper extremity tendinosis are more common in, in work-related uh, uh, circumstances. Comes with paratenonitis. Uh, so this is in an inflammation surrounding the tendon. Occasionally, tendinosis may be associated with paratenonitis, which is the inflammation of this paratenon. And this is the one that gives you lots of pain. As I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, tenosis is usually asymptomatic. But if the paratenon gets involved, they will have pain. Uh, Paratenonous tissue contains a high concentration of sensory nerves, so they get more pain because of the uh, sensory endings. Yeah? Paratenonitis present, uh, commonly, can present with swollen and erythematous weight. Commonly present with uh, swollen and erythematous tendon. For example, in decubens, uh, tenosynovitis. And in fact, tenosynovitis is actually uh, used for decubens disease uh, to indicate there's an inflammation of both the paratenon and the synovial sheath. Uh, so uh, I hope this covers the, um, the terminology uh, of there are ten, uh, for, of tendinitis, tenosis, paratenonitis, and tenosinitis. Now, when we have this, uh, we come to a, you know clinical uh, imaging uh, in the clinical examination. As we say just now, there's uh, pain, and then uh, uh, functional uh, being uh, affected, and uh, commonly we use uh, imaging to help us in our diagnosis. And one commonest one that we do is the ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan is cheap, it's fast way to, to perform, uh, and it allows for us to actually stitch, uh, and uh, it can also uh, allow us to assess evolution and complications of the uh, either muscle or tendon injury. The um, ultrasound sensitivity is said to be 77% for non-structural. Non-structural means that you don't see much uh, changes outside, you cannot suspect, but they complain to you, so that's non-structural. For structural injuries, you can really see those, uh, for example, these are more severe conditions. For example, in ankle sprain grade one, which uh, there's, sometimes you don't see uh, much changes there, but you can, but the, but the uh, athletes complaints of pain, that is more likely uh, non-structural. But if it's grade two or grade three, then that's already structural injuries, yeah? Presence of edema helps to make the diagnosis, so hence the earlier the better, as hematoma peaks at about 24 to 48 hours, meaning that if you have someone who has got uh, muscle or tendon injury, the faster they get to be scanned, uh, that will be better in terms of diagnosis. And it's also really easy to repeat, and just remember that it's, it's a dynamic study is doable, uh, and uh, that includes the extent of vision. So um, that means, one, you can actually do certain uh, dynamic test, impingement test, for example, you can actually do it while doing the ultrasound. Yeah? And um, color Doppler helps us to visualize better because we, now we can see the arteries and veins and that can actually quantify the amount of blood within the muscle, the muscle which is uh, the injured muscle as well. Okay, for MRI, MRI has got, it's actually better 
than uh, ultrasound uh, on certain things. Yeah, it's high um, intrinsic in contrast and fluid sensitivity that allows us to detect even minimal changes as well. So it is said to be 92 percent of these found right, to be 92 percent sensitive for non-structural injuries. So much more if it's uh, structural injuries. Yeah. Uh, and it provides a wider evaluation of deeper muscles, so you can actually see deeper structures uh, compared to ultrasound. It can measure well the volume, structure, and extent of lesion through comparative examinations. So MRI seems to actually have uh, added advantage uh, compared to ultrasound. Uh, so which one should we decide? Uh, but based on what I mentioned earlier, then you can see that you know being cheap, fast, so that and the, the sensitivity and accuracy is quite good for the uh, ultrasound. So you can actually always start with this first, and occasionally you may need to actually do ultra, uh, MRI, and sometimes um, you do MRI to do uh, to correlate as well. In fact, recent evidences recommend the use of a combined MRI and ultrasound, as MRI alone cannot precisely measure the extent of a structural damage. So there's a new study that comes uh, that talk about the staging as well as which day the, the staging, the use of staging uh, in this uh, situation is actually to prognosticate the, uh, the uh, injury. So um, more and more, uh, uh, there's more and more studies that says that it's, it's not just ultrasound that you need, you probably need, or just an MRI, you probably need both of them. So I already discussed with you on that one, but when it comes to clinical here, the clinical seems to still have among the best because it's definitely the cheapest and that's the fastest. I mean, I'm talking about if you are at a sideline, you need to do all this uh, examination uh, to confirm your diagnosis and to make decision whether this athlete can play or not, for example, in football, then the clinical is the one that you actually use. Okay, I'm just gonna go show you all um, a few of the clinical grading system, but we are not going to actually discuss this. Yeah? I'll come to the management part of the muscle and tendon injury. Um, we go by the basic five steps. Uh, we start with the first stage, which is the acute management. This happens uh, in the first two to three days of muscle and tendon injury. Uh, the common protocol we use is the uh, price protocol. And just remember that it is used to reduce local temperature, the metabolic uh, requests, or the demand, yeah? metabolic demand, and bleeding as well. Oh, sorry, to reduce uh, reduce bleeding and reduce pain. Uh, just to add on, uh, many of us actually now starts. Uh, we have been actually using this uh, that uh, we shouldn't be resting as only resting. There should be relative rest, or some people call it active rest. Uh, basically to mobilize as soon as possible and as much as tolerated. So that would help in terms of uh, rehabilitation. The second stage is uh, uh, post-acute management or the sub-acute phase, usually three to seven days after trauma. And uh, stretching is uh, one of the most important component of this. Uh, so uh, the, when you stretch this muscle or this tendon, that helps to reduce the peripheral neural tension. What it means is that when someone has just injured his uh, muscle or tendon, then there is actually inhibition due to neural tension. So uh, if you stretch uh, the affected part, then you may actually reduce this neural tension and that would allow better rehabilitation. Strengthening, so you commonly we start with isometric and uh, then we continue on, or sometimes we do them all together, but commonly let's just say isometric first, concentric and eccentric. Uh, progressive training, stability exercise, balance and proprioception, and we also include cross stability to a certain extent. Right, at the same time, I think I should interject now to recall back on th this particular part about eccentric contraction, which I say is the main cause of, uh, of uh, muscle tendon injury. While it actually uh, is the main cause of, uh, of uh, muscle tendon injury, we also learned that centric stretching, uh, sorry, stretch, centric training may prevent occurrence of injury. Uh, and uh, centric training as well reduces stiffness 
and viscoelasticity of the muscle tendon system. Uh, intensive training may prevent traumatic changes as it occurs when undertaking short repetitive eccentric contractions, which evoke evident protective adaptations of the muscles, which means is that if you keep on actually uh, training people with uh, eccentric contractions, repetitive or eccentric contractions, that will serve as a protection to against uh, uh, eccentric contraction induced muscle injury, muscle tendon injury. Yeah? And also stretching prior to eccentric training prevents pain and loss of strength. So these are all uh, supporting that the um, eccentric training or eccentric exercise is actually good uh, for some for us and, and protect us against uh, muscle and tendon injury. Right, I covered the first two stages of the management. Now comes the third stage, which is functional rehabilitation and general athletic uh, reconditioning. So this is actually the more sport specific uh, training. It's supposed to improve sensitive and motor abilities, muscle resistance and strength training. So it can be like uh, talking about walking. It can also be like running, jumping, you know. That. So these are like uh, functional uh, exercises. Uh, and uh, and uh, the fourth stage is slightly different than the third stage where we are actually talking about more injury specific, meaning that uh, you we repeat more many more series of uh, sport specific movements that would have actually caused the index traumatic insult. For example, if you have hamstring, so we probably will actually push you do more of the hamstring just to want to build the injured part, which is also to test you at the same time, also to actually uh, uh, to enhance or encourage uh, recovery uh, or rehabilitation of that side. Fifth stage is about return to competition, and we usually do this gradually. Right. Uh, in terms of um, tendinopathy treatment, um, we've talked about uh, treatment type of, you know, like, uh, sorry, we, we have, didn't discuss in detail just now. Just talk a little bit on this one. There are a number of things that we do. For example, the physiotherapy, which we use. Uh, Sorry, we use centric exercises and deep friction massage that can be actually helpful. Uh, extracorporeal shortwave therapy uh, can actually promote proliferation of healing growth factors. Uh, GTN, uh, it helps to actually enhance collagen synthesis and fibroblast proliferation. However, uh, we have got so many side effects on this one, uh, especially headache and dizziness, so um, it's not really popular. Uh, corticosteroid injections, yeah, but we must be careful as well. If it's a tear, then we may actually, uh, you know, weaken the structure. So, and uh, it may also predispose to tendon rupture. Uh, PRP uh, is, a, is also a promising uh, a method where uh, we actually deliver the growth factors uh, through platelet rich plasma, uh, even hold the injections, yeah. And this, um, this typically, sorry, they are generally safe and uh, there are evidence that it, it actually helps. Uh, but uh, with the current, uh, you know, the more things that we do now, uh, at, at the moment, uh, a number of uh, um, reviews are saying that it's kind, kind of inconclusive for us to, uh, to arrive at uh, one, uh, one, uh, recommendation on PRP. Yeah? So we do have prolotherapy, which uh, we inject irritants uh, in the area of injury. And typically this is the hypertonic dextrose. Uh, we inject that through uh, ultrasound guidance. It's generally safe, um, but the, the evidence is not so great on this one. Uh, scleral therapy, uh, using sclerosin agent, for example, polydocanol, uh, also done under ultrasound. Uh, we also found that it's fairly safe. And the idea of the, the, the action here is actually to sclerose uh, the neovascularization that um, I've discussed with you guys in telenosis. There is a lot of neovascularization and this actually uh, relates to uh, telenotic pain. Uh, stem cells, uh, so this one is also a promising area, but right now uh, we haven't got good evidence or high quality evidence, um, and it's very expensive. 
it's very expensive. So um, it's still, I would say, inconclusive as well. And uh, and it actually has been receiving lots of uh, attention. Um, there's this part, per percutaneous needle of tenotomy, which uh, we fenestrate or we kind of like uh, do a small uh, poking on the uh, tendons. And uh, that's supposed to actually uh, cause mechanical disruption and bleeding into the area and induce healing following the, uh, this particular bleeding. Um, so unfortunately, there have been cases that uh, reports on uh, tendon rupture. So uh, it's not really commonly practiced, although there are also evidence that this actually uh, works. So just a few more uh, practical takeaways. Uh, in direct injury, which can cause you know muscle injury or tendon injury due to direct injury or direct contact, uh, usually, uh, for example, contusion, yeah, they usually need reassessment. So if someone gets to you with severe pain after a direct uh, injury or direct contact, you shouldn't actually rush to make decision whether he's actually to come back or to sports uh, uh, immediately or not or you know, to estimate how many days you'll be absent. So usually uh, you would need to reassess them again uh, 24 hours later. Uh, now don't forget about a psychology, which may actually affect both rehabilitation and as well as injury risk. Uh, at least one, at least this particular article by Greif and Badu, uh, mentioned about uh, personal cognitive skills such as risk taking, impulsivity, reflex, special awareness, pattern identification can all be the key for either you become, you know, you are better player, right? Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, those people who cannot actually cope with your, your so called being better technical skills may actually risk it by, you know, passing. Uh, by imposing injuries on, on you. So meaning that if some of the people, some other players may try to, or because they cannot cope with this particular uh, better, better technical skills, and sometimes they actually do foul play. All right, with that, I think I've covered my parts of uh, muscle and tendon injury. So I would like to summarize that. I presented to you an overview of muscle and tendon injury uh, from the start, which is from felons and some of the uh, the uh, basic signs of uh, muscle and tendon injury, and then what are the muscle and tendons which are actually more predisposed. And I covered until uh, you know, the uh, grading or uh, imaging as well as the uh, uh, management. So with that, thank you very much. I end my presentation. Back to you, Dr. Chung. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Halim, for the very wonderful and delightful talks regarding the overview of muscle and tendon injuries. Uh, I received a lot of questions. Uh, some of them is actually uh, quite tricky one. So we will leave uh, until the Q&A sessions later after all the presenter presented their uh, talks. Okay, so the second speaker like to invite uh, Mr. Ram. Mr. Ram is the sport physiotherapist of the Selangor Football Club. He has, uh, having, he has uh, 11 years of experience treating um, sport injuries and sport rehabilitations for Malaysian's top footballer in various uh, local football clubs. Okay, without further ado, I would like to invite um, Mr. Ram to deliver uh, his talk. Hello, uh, a very good evening to all Tan Sri's, Datuk Sri's, 
Datuk, doctors, uh, specialists, everyone, physiotherapists who is attending this webinar. My name is Sirla Ramana Raju. I am from Slang OFC Physiotherapist, Sports Physiotherapist. Uh, my presentation for today would be on superinductive system in treating sports injuries. Also, uh, my name would be, you can refer me to me as Ram. Uh, I'm very well known as Ram. I've been, I would share my profile a little bit. So before I share about my profile, I would like to start off with this. Um, imagine jumping out of a skydiving plane and discovering your parachute doesn't work. What memories would flash before you? Now imagine that the parachute opened, how different would you act when you landed? Okay, with that, let's uh, go on with me. Uh, my name is Ram. I've been a sports physiotherapy for 11 years. My career started in FAM um, and then moving to ATM. Uh, Klantan, Perak, and now I'm permanently in Selangor. The pictures you see is the various pictures of me with uh, Raja Mudia Selangor, the Menteri Besar, the national team trainer, Dr. Wazin, uh, Dr. Dean, with all these uh, athletes, amazing athletes, high performance athletes, um, with the coach Mehmet, um, uh, won Malaysia Cup as a player and won. Malaysia Cup as a coach. So these are uh, the people that I used to work with. Nothing is best than winning championship. This is what we aim for. The moment you win something, it's everything. Okay? So moving the role of sports physiotherapists in football. The first thing that we are taught is diagnosing. Accurate diagnosis is very important and then followed by the treatment injury management. What I call it a good diagnosis, good program comes out with a good outcome. So return to play, return to sports, return to training, whatever the technology is, the main thing is the player is pain-free, injury-free and coming back to sports with his highest ability to perform in it. Rehabilitation approach for sports injury. It may be different between other sports, but I'm more focused in football. <clears throat> number one, number one, working on injury prevention, preventive approach. First, injury prevention. When do we do injury prevention? Every day, every time before training starts, every time the training ends. What does it contain in the injury prevention? Activation. Early in the morning, sometimes we don't know what is the lifestyle of the player. So we prepare the player by doing activation. This is a part of injury prevention. How do we do activation? It's simple. Foam rollers and exercise band. You do the stretching. If you have some tightness, you do the stretching. If the physio is around, the missio is around, the player would call or there's some limitation of movement, we would do some sort of stretching and trigger point for the player. So this will improve his performance in training. Every training is like a final match. So the player must prepare his body, he or her, for combat, for impact, for every training. And then he can adapt for the real event. Healing approach, uh, when there's an injury, this is a little bit tricky, but in a nutshell, we do the injury treatment. We do the preventive uh, measure so that the, re, the, the, the injured part don't get re-injured again. But again, there's a long study, there's a long approach, but this again is in a nutshell. First is and foremost is very important for every physiotherapist and for me is understanding the biomechanics of the injury. How your body moves. You have to observe the player in the first half, second half or before going to the pitch. This is important. When he comes out from warm-up, we have to understand the body language. So understanding the biomechanics of injury. So all before the player gets injured, if he's limping coming out of um, the warm-up or he's holding his hamstrings or holding his quadriceps or holding his shoulder, that is indicating you as a therapist, as a physician, something is wrong with the player. So you can see the chart that I'm showing you, the various part of the body 
uh, the different color codes. So I'm trying what I'm trying to implement here. Um, if the can if you can see the third picture from your left is showing on the shoulder, the hand. So it goes in an X chain like this. So if the player let's move lower, if the player or the athlete is having pain on the low back, but then you discover on his left. I mean, on the left side, uh, his erector spina is having tightness. But then when you diagnose and you're palpating, you discover there's weakness or muscle wasting on the right side of his gluteus. So you know, by strengthening his gluteus, would take off the pressure on his left low back and his left erector spina. So you know, because you have the experience, you know the concept of the kinetic chain. So this is important. This is a part of your diagnosing tool. Understanding the integrated functional movement, also known to me as uh, the mechanism of injury. I know the topic doesn't uh, say that what I'm saying, but in football or in any sport, specifically in football, to understand the mechanism of injury. Because in football, it's a multi-directional sport. You're going to use your head, your face, your ears, your toes, your nose, your hands, your chest, your back, your, your thighs, in every single part of your body will be used during a football match. So you need to understand the mechanism of injury, like uh, pre-warm-up, post-warm-up, uh, during the match, everything you need to be vigilant. You need to notice about this, about an athlete. Not just by going up the match, sitting in the bench, enjoying the game. No, but in every single movement. That's what in me, in Slango FC, we don't conduct rehabilitation, physiotherapy during a training. We only do post-training, pre-training, but in training, we are focused on the training session and looking at the integrated functional movement of the athlete. So any indication we would know uh, whether the player is ready for training or for the match. Moving forward, uh, using the tools of rehabilitation in rehabilitation or physiotherapy management on the athlete, on the player, which I would strongly emphasize on this. Diagnosis is done by the specialists. They have been studying for years and years for this. So we will leave it to the specialists. As physiotherapists, we are able to do the diagnosis but not as good as the doctors because again we are focused on rehabilitation diagnosing maybe not as good as uh, the doctors the specialists the experts in the field so first we start off using therapeutic modalities all therapeutic modalities we are applying on the player whichever that is available in our center in our club in our association, whichever, to help accelerate the rehabilitation, the healing process of the injured area. With that, we also use medication which is strong, which is prescribed, sorry, it's not strong, but strongly recommended being prescribed by the doctors. They are qualified to do this. Physiotherapists are not. We just follow the instruction of the doctors. We can, we can, uh, discuss about the types of medication is given to the players but end of the day the the, the, the authority or the answer or the, the the decision comes from the doctor whether or not to prescribe the athlete with medication with medication there might be some contraindication like allergy uh, like not suitable or for doping the best person to know this are the doctors so we always work hand in hand with the doctors and then gym facilities gym facilities we do the training for the players physiotherapy term because we don't want to overlap the strength and conditioning department because it's a whole new department a whole new part for the player to 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 graduate and to start training so for the physio we do strengthening we do conditioning for the player to have comfort to have full rom to reduce swelling and then goes back to uh, not only modalities we use some places some centers some clubs they don't have even a basic ultrasound i'm not going to mention which club but 
I've experienced this. So how do I work? I work with hot and cold, either with hot pack. Uh, I will prepare hot pack and put it in my hot bean and then come to the training and whichever players have muscle soreness or tightness, I would apply this and cold therapy. Cold therapy, I use ice, uh, ice bath, localized ice, cryo. But again, in Selengo, we have almost complete uh, treatment. Again, that's what I would love to invite all of you guys to come and have a look at our setup. Um, therapeutic exercises versus conditioning exercises. Therapeutic exercises for layman, it's for the normal person who's doing exercises, who wants to build up their body or to have a weight loss program or to have like a gym group workout session. So this is therapeutic exercises. Very easy. It's very relaxful. It's like when you sweat a lot, it's so nice. So this is therapeutic exercise for the normal uh, people. But when you're talking about conditioning exercises, it's more to sport specific exercises. Like in, to me, what I do is in football, I go to um, position specific exercises uh, when they're injured and they're coming back to, to competition or coming back to training, coming back to play. So I, I, I do these exercises before I hand, it, hand them over to the strength and conditioning department. I, I do this so that I know the condition of the player, I know what he's capable of, and then alongside when he's doing his strength and conditioning with the coach, strength and conditioning coach, I will be with them. I don't conduct any rehabilitation during uh, the training session because again, coming back to the slide previously, that I need to know, I must know what is happening during training and how the player sustain the injury. Okay, and then, Talking about electrotherapy, this is what we are here for, okay? Uh, electrotherapy means uh, we are doing external, introducing electrotherapy current to the injured area. So it's divided into two. One is external currents and one is internal currents. Our body also produces currents, all sides of currents. So this is how our body helps to heal itself. So by, ex, um, by, by, by introducing external features, like again, I like to use layman so that it's easier to understand. So like putting a turbo to a normal 1.6 engine, so it accelerates the healing. So example, our body is a 1.6 engine and the turbo is the electrotherapy currents. So you're accelerating the healing, telling the body, hey, this is not working. Let's work together with the external force and let's come up with the good results to heal this pain and to reduce the pain. Using, <clears throat> using electrotherapy uh, modalities in rehabilitation, I, I use it a lot on strengthening process. When I'm doing this, um, I can see really, really good results. While the player is doing um, exercises, I apply electrotherapy, I apply TENS, I apply Russian stimulation, before that, I apply um, ultrasound, also in electrotherapy modalities. This to get me to, to reduce the swelling, to improve the ROM, and to activate the muscle. Once I achieve this, the players, the athletes, have no issue in performing the activity or the task given according to their ability. So all this, all this we consider in, in, uh, in electrotherapy modalities in uh, rehabilitation. So what is in the slide? I'm so sorry, I'm not reading the slide because the slide, I'm sure you guys can read about this and I can send my slides, but what is important now is how I apply this on, on, on the patient, on the subject, on the clients, on the patient. It, I mean, however you want to call it, but I like to call it athlete. I would like to call it my players. Applying energy. In therapy is divided into few parts. There's mechanical energy, there's conduction of heat and cold, electrical currents, and radiation. So we have pressure therapy for under mechanical energy. We have lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic drainage I use a lot when after post match uh, we call it recovery boots, uh, layman term. Uh, I do ultrasound. I do shock wave if there's any. 
uh, tightness, uh, shockwave also I use it on spurs, shockwave I use it if the tissue is not healing properly and I think I need an inflammation, I purposely cause inflammation with shockwave. Also dry needling, uh, it helps in reducing, uh, uh, in reducing the muscle tightness and to achieve trigger point, so both is the same. Then radio uh, frequency, uh, such as uh, radio frequency, the latest that I'm using is targeted radio frequency. Shortwave diatomy and microwave is a little bit old technology, but what I find, uh, targeted radio frequency that I've been using on my athletes and my players have tremendous effect on them. And then let's talk about uh, conduction of heat and cold. So both has contraindication and both have indication and both are dangerous if you're not careful. Like heat can cause burn, ice can cause burn. Heat can cause muscle relaxation, ice also can achieve this. So it depends on what you want to achieve and what your body is comfortable. But yeah, when for acute cases, don't use hot pack and use uh, cold pack, cryo, and please check the skin surface, be very careful because ice can cause burn and it's very painful for the athlete. Talking back about electric currents, which all of us might know about this, uh, we know tense, but right, electrical current has a lot. We have galvanic, we have Russian stimulation, we have tense, and so many more. So there's another study about this as well, but if you're interested to know more about this, please do. Don't hesitate to give me a text or an email, I will be able to help you. So these are the various types of current um, intensity that we use on various cases and then radiation. Radiation that doesn't mean that you know like when doctors say radiation they say radiotherapy for cancer. No, in physiotherapy it's always it's easing, it's helping, it's very comforting. So what we have here is infrared uh, light therapy, you know the red light that hits your muscle for muscle relaxation. Laser, high intensity laser is to reduce swelling and to reduce pain. So once we achieve this again with these therapies, we are able to have good ROM. Once you have good ROM, you're able to work with the player uh, better. Coming to the main topic, uh, which I was impressed with this uh, machine, uh, super inductive system. Uh, it says you can reach up to 150 Hertz, 2.5 Tesla. Everybody's asking, what is 2.5 Tesla? What is Tesla? Uh, electromagnetic field is calculated with Tesla. The, 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 the terminology is called Tesla, like weight is calculated with kilogram, height is calculated with centimeters or meters, distance is calculated with uh, distance it calculated with kilometers or meters. So coming back to this, uh, the strength of the magnet is calculated with 2.5 Tesla. So this is what superinductive system about electromagnetic stimulation. So super inductive system like uh, uh, you can reach low intensity uh, for threshold, uh, sorry, low intensity uh, sensory threshold and high intensity for motor threshold. We do this treatment according to what the body is comfortable with. So yeah, it can go up to 100%, which is operating 2.5 Tesla. It's very not comfortable, I wouldn't say painful, I would always want to be not comfortable for the client or for the player. But again, when you see my video, I achieve amazing results when I go to 2.5 Tesla. Hey, why do they, they make this machine 2.5 Tesla if you're not going to use it? But be safe and know what you're doing. So the therapy benefits, ah, this again, why am I amazed? The placement, the movement of the arms, and it's non-contact. It's so, I would say, Sharia compliance. So some of the players, some I have some female athletes who don't like to be touched or who don't like to, to expose. I would say this is an amazing tool. And then, yeah, these are the placement of the therapy. And I took this picture in BTL headquarters. Um, I would prefer the background to be red, but never mind. It's still BTL headquarters and I would respect that. And yeah, this is lying down. It's so comfortable on the knee. They are on the left picture they were doing on my neck. 
and on the picture on the right it was doing on my tendon i do run a lot so i do have this pain sometimes so this is just to uh, remove my pain i would say actually it solves my pain and i'm able to have full rom and pain free happy man uh, when you're uh, having no pain i'm happy and i can do my runs so yeah so this uh the picture on my left is just to demonstrate that again with the thick jeans and i'm even able to feel the magnetic field and on my the picture on the right is on my low back i don't have any problem my room back just again to show you guys the demonstration of this 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 uh equipment okay uh, these are my numbers these are my phone numbers my email if you have any questions that when later on that when we open the floor for questions you're not able to ask me and you have to leave the presentation or anything you have just take a screenshot take your phone take a picture of this and i'm available uh, anytime for for to clarify anything also uh, i would like to add that any doctors physiotherapists who would like to visit and for a uh, for for a demonstration on how i apply sis i'm proud to say that um, i'm the only physiotherapist in sports who have this machine and i'm so happy to share with everyone the benefits of this and i'm so happy that if with this machine we can help malaysian athletes to achieve greater heights this is my main aim and i'm yeah and our clinic yeah we will be opening the first football clinic or rehabilitation clinic for the public soon i will update you guys on that very soon thank you and please enjoy the video on the practical application yeah it's 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 a true case and please be please pay attention to the video you will be amazed with this effects of this super inductive system or electro uh, magnetic stimulation i would uh, wait for you guys after the third presenter uh, so good luck enjoy and majula sukan untuk negara Hello, my name is Ram. I'm a physiotherapist for Selangor Football uh, Club, SFC. Um, today here with me is Marco Grimm. Uh, he's a physiotherapist. He's from German. He's with us. Um, reason being he's with me, he's been having shoulder pain for the last 15 years. So first of all, before we do any treatment, we do anything, we have to do the diagnosis first. A good diagnosis and a proper diagnosis is very important before you start with any electrotherapy uh, machines and also need to identify the contraindication of this machine so first of all you have to ask your patients whether they have any implants whether any health condition or anything that is going to affect them while during uh, while doing this treatment so let us start off uh, by introducing marco marco uh, how are you feeling today i'm good I'm yeah good. So how's your shoulder? Shoulder is like how you explain, yeah. I have shoulder problems over 15 years yes. already. Yeah. And how you explain to them, I cannot can take care of that good on yeah. myself. Okay. So I'd be happy that we have this machine okay. to help me. All right, so now I would like you to remove your t-shirt mm -hmm. and I would like to show to our guests uh, uh, how is your muscle mm -hmm. uh, condition is. Mm -hmm. okay, let me get this, yeah, put it here. Okay, now I would like you to move your arms straight up like this. Is there any limitation, any pain? Yeah. Okay, can you identify and show me where you're feeling the pain or discomfort? Uh, I got like a discomfort okay. pain right here. Yes, all right. That's that's keep me holding me down okay. so I can not move. Okay, can you move your arms as much as you can? Okay, now you can see he has limitation on his left shoulder movement. Okay, let's come down and then you can notice on his neck there is some uh, difference of the muscle left and right okay now this will be very obvious of his muscle so he has an issue on his left side and his right side is okay this is where he indicated that his pain is remember 
the point of pain that doesn't mean that is the source of the issue so now this is where I come in and identify where is the source of the issue not the pain but the source of the problem so now I want you to lift up this way put your hands behind your back and lift up and can you see the muscle over here over here you have good muscle bulk but over here can you try to lift up put this down put your right hand down and lift up as much as you can and can you see try I'm gonna push it a bit further okay can you see the muscle twitching so that means I have identified that he has rotator cuff uh, issues and the problem so and when we press we give a depression here can you see slight 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 swelling see okay so now I'm going to go straight to the super inductive system EMS electromagnetic stimulation or on him on this affected area there is two ways of using this machine one is the standard protocol which is already preset by BTL company and also once you get into the machine you would know how to use the machine according to you and what you need okay Marco quickly I really want you to lie down mm -hmm. on the bed on the bed lie down flat we are going to go straight away to the application of treatment for the superinductive system so very important the client the patient the player have to be in comfortable mode very comfortable okay Marco are you feeling okay feeling all right thank you so now we're going to start the treatment okay so now I'm going to use the preset protocol of this machine and I'm going to show you in this way later on I have to change the angle so that the machine is comfortably sitting on him so now basically what I'm going to do is the preset protocol I'm going to go for the body chart here and then I'm going to click on shoulder and I'm going to click on acute chronic analgesic chronic sorry analgesic chronic is a preset program because he's having pain again I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm doing the treatment for the root cause of the pain not on the pain area remember so this is a six arm joint to me I think this is one of amazing machines because it's able to move according to what I want and where I want it that is the basic meaning of the six arm joints so now I'm going to move the machine this way and apply and then we always ask say we are always holding in one hand and identifying do you have anything here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So number one, you're palpating with your hand, and number two, the machine will help to palpate for you. Okay. Then we lock. Always lock. Lock all the joints and never release this until you have locked all the arms. Okay. And first part of the treatment is where the machine will palpate for you, diagnosing, targeting the point of pain Marco I'm going to increase the intensity slowly let me know if that is the point of the pain yeah okay perfect okay and the treatment starts now Marco tell me to stop is it enough Okay, okay so basically um, uh, looking forward this machine is super inductive system or also known as electromagnetic stimulation it uses the strength of 2.5 Tesla that is how you calculate the strength of the magnet most of the time uh, when we hear about strength of magnet and 2.5 Tesla they use it for imaging MRI so where how powerful is this MRI that you are able to see a ligament but now they have compact this to a little tiny machine like this and to do the treatment so with this treatment with this SIS you can treat various various kind of uh, sports injury especially knocks you know when an athlete a football player gets knocked in his ITB probably for the next two three days he's not be able to play or he has limitation of movement because there's a muscle knot or there's some tightness over there or there's some trauma over there he's not being able to move his movement his ROM is limited because of this but with super inductive system 
it gives you better blood flow it stimulates the nerve and it accelerates healing so with super inductive system on the later part i will show you on how i use it on my own method that how i bring back and to reduce the pain amazing amazing you have uh, good results in joint mobilization you have good results in the muscles uh, tightness you also reduce in the muscle uh, in the swelling how because there is movement of the muscle and the muscle is not tight you have a really good blood flow so that's the difference between in the normal ultrasound ultrasound is to reduce swelling improve but it takes longer studies have shown that or uh, maybe BTL can show you the study studies have shown that 80% greater treatment greater results with the electromagnetic stimulation when we are doing the treatment on an athlete we have better outcome comparatively with electrotherapy uh, TANS, Russian stimulation, galvanic, whatever electrostimulation is there and better results than the conventional uh, ultrasound so this is state of the art my experience with state of the art uh, equipment and I'm very very happy to work with it very comfortable and, and you see amazing results I will show you right after the treatment how does it feel not only with uh, not only the treatment for muscles, it can treat um, tendons, tendinopathy, whether it's tendinitis, tendinotistis, anything about the tendon, whether it's Achilles tendon, patella tendon, runner's knee, anything. So this is how it works. So for today, for now, I'm just showing on his rotator cuff. And yeah, this is the practical application of the super inductive system or also known as electromagnetic stimulation uh, I rather use it as EMS than super inductive system because I'm not promoting the brand I'm promoting the treatment method EMS so for this machine uh, why I say the second method is this is my own method I've discovered this after messing around with the machine on myself and my friends and family so I've discovered this method and it is really effective after we are doing the general treatment and then we go on this just for one minute so what I do is like earlier when you saw the, the, the intensity was 80% according to what he likes now I'm going to increase it to 100% so first by applying the machine on the pain area I know the pain area is over here the, the problem area and then I start the machine just for one minute this is a preset okay so the machine is working at 100% capacity of 2.5 tesla the 100% that you see is maximum capacity of 2.5 tesla so this is only for one minute and I'll move I'll move the machine and follow the muscle and this is only for one minute it might cause discomfort so always check it is very not comfortable for the client but we only only do for one minute when you hear the sound and then we follow okay it's like music it's like the feeling so our one minute is done and are we ready to be surprised to see the immediate the immediate difference the immediate improve in rom we can check this now marco would you like to sit down yeah. i would like you to do the two three movement that we did before the treatment starts mm -hmm. as you can see remember I had a problem on the left side can you see the muscle there's great improvement on the muscle on the left side compared to right side on the right side earlier was good but now the muscle on the left side has improved can you do this movement Marco your hands behind your back and then go up oh my god it's so good now yep now just focus in front and go up and go down go up and just play with it go up yeah open and then go up can you see the improvement? 
Can you see the muscle bulk has come out and here is sink. But this is the original muscle structure. We have already activated the muscle. Hello, uh, I'm Marco Grimm from Germany. I work currently with Salongo FC and how Mr. Ram already explained, I have over 15 years problem with my left shoulder. I was traveling so much around the world to get new uh, views on, on therapy um, missions um, from the different uh, countries. And the first day I went over, I was talking with Mr. Ram about my problem, about my shoulder, and he gave me a, a response about the new technology of the EMS. I said, hey, Let's, let, let's have a try on this one because I tried so many stuff already to get uh, uh, my shoulder back in a good way but I didn't found nothing to get it like I want to be like I had it. So the first treatment on this machine I was totally surprised um, how quick the pain was going uh, down, how good I was feeling back again to get my functions back. I get my, 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 the painless, get a comfortable shoulder. So I was really surprised about this machine because how I said, I have so many experience about different uh, treatments already, but the technology of EMS is for me, uh, what I feel now on this kind of problem over 15 years, really a best, a really, really good, good uh, technology to help people in a comfortable treatment uh, session so they get quick back um, like we need to have uh, a quick response from in issues so if the players need to be back return to play so this machine this technology ems is the perfect way to give them a hand in a comfortable situation to get the healthy back what they need thank you Thank you so much, Mr. Ram, for the just for the wonderful talks and also uh, very interesting demonstrations on the EMS or, or the super inductive system. So um, we will now call upon the representative from the BTL Industrial Malaysia to show us uh, and also to uh, demonstrate the usage of the super inductive system also to elaborate more uh, regarding uh, how these machines really uh, work. Uh, please welcome uh, Miss Audrey. Our latest technology, which is the super inductive system, and briefly explain about the mechanism of actions and wide uses of this modality in the medical field. In this slide, I would like to explain what is electromagnetic field. So the definition for electromagnetic fields are a combination of invisible electric and magnetic fields of force. They occur naturally and due to human activity. So in our superinductive system, the mechanism of action is as such. We have a coil in the applicator which generates the high intensity pulse electromagnetic field. Then the electromagnetic field interacts with the human body and causes depolarization of the nerve and the muscle. The use of magnetic fields in medicine. We use them in rehabilitation and physical medicine, which uses pulse magnetic fields with intensities up to ones of Tesla. We use them in diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, such as the transcranial magnetic stimulation, and also for diagnostic purposes, which is the magnetic resonance imaging. We also use the superinductive system for treatment purposes such as pain relief, joint mobilization, fracture healing, myostimulation, and lastly, spasticity reduction. Here, I will be explaining about how the superinductive system reacts with the human body. In the first picture, the introduction, when the neuron is induced with intense electromagnetic field by the superinductive system, it triggers the action potential which further transfers the electrical signal in the neural tissue. And in the first second picture, the depolarization. 
Electrical signal induced by the superinductive system is further transferred through the neuron and depolarization which causes the voltage changes of the neuron membrane. In the third picture for signal conduction and repolarization, the induced electrical signal is conducted along the neuron with a mediator called the acetylcholine is released into the neuromuscular joint. Acetylcholine is a compound which occurs through the nervous system in which its function is as a neurotransmitter. So in our fourth picture for the muscle contraction, this causes the muscle cells to bind together and further conduct the induced electrical signal through the muscle. This involves the activity of contractile proteins that cause the muscle contraction. And lastly, in muscle relaxation, the muscle relax the cross bridges of the contractile proteins are discontinued and the muscle relax. In the clinical background, I will be explaining how the superinductive system works on pain management in the human body and how it targets three different levels of pain using the different frequencies and intensity. In this slide, I will be speaking about the principle of therapeutic effect. So one of the therapeutic effects of superinductive system is pain relief. So it works on frequency specific pain management. It is indicated for all stages of painful conditions and it manages pain based on three different kinds of pain control theory. One is the peripheral pattern of theory. Two is the gate control theory of pain and also the endogenous opioid theory of pain. We will see in the next slide how every different principle works on with the SIS. In endogenous opioid theory of pain, physiological energesia can be defined as a form of pain relief induced by the endogenous effectors that simulate the same targets, which is the opioid receptors, as a natural for example, like morphine or synthetic opioids. So, when pain is present, our body creates analgesic opioids to block the pain. And this happens in our central nervous system, but also in the periphery of our body. So, in the superinductive system, we use a frequency range of 2 to 10 Hz to support the creation and secretions of these analgesic opioids, and it helps block the pain. This frequency is also intended for chronic pain conditions. In gate control theory of pain, it asserts that a non-painful input closes the nerve gates to the painful input, which prevents the pain sensation from traveling to the central nervous system. The gate control of pain describes how a non-painful sensation can override and reduce pain sensations. In other words, the spinal cord has a gate which can be opened and let the pain pass to the central nervous system when we stimulate the thin nerve fibers. When we stimulate the thick nerve fibers, we are closing the gate. The superinductive system uses the frequency of 60 to 100 Hz to stimulate thick nerve fibers and block the pain. Hence, the pain is not transferred to the central nervous system. This frequency range is intended for acute and subacute conditions. In peripheral pattern theory of pain, the peripheral sensory receptors responding to the touch, warm and other non-damaging as well as damaging stimuli give rise to a non-painful or painful experience. And as a result of these differences, the patterns of the signals are sent through the nervous system. In other words also, the pain is also presented as a code. And this code is transferred to the central nervous system and recognizes pain. When we use the superinductive system in the range of 120 to 140 hertz, we remodulate this code. This code is not recognized as pain in the central nervous system. Hence, the frequency range is intended for subacute pain conditions. Here, we will be speaking about the superinductive system and how it works for joint mobilization. Joint mobilization is achieved through repetitive contractions of the muscles surrounding the joint capsule. These repetitive contractions substitute manual joint mobilization which leads to joint play restoration. 
It can also be used for patients with osteoporosis as it has consistent pressure and does not cause any harm to the patient. In this video, I will be explaining about our superinductive system and how it works on joint mobilization. So as you can see here in the video, I am assessing the patient's range of motion as we will be doing the joint mock protocol for this patient. So here we will identify the area of pain and once we have the area of pain, we will place the machine at the correct area. So as you can see here, we have something called a six joint arm where I am loosening it. So what we will do, we will take the applicator and apply it exactly at the area where the patient has the plane and lock it in. All right, so we will place it there. So it is a good thing if you are short of time and you do not have enough stuff. This is why we have this machine where you can be hands free and go and take care of other clients. So as you can see here, you can see a little bit of flickering. All right, so our super inductive system helps with joint mobilization in this way. So we will usually put the applicator and we will check at this correct area where it is happening and we will stop the machine as we can go. All right, as you can see here, the patient's arm is moving in involuntarily due to the strong magnetic field that we use in our superinductive system. So this is how we will have joint mobilization according to the area that you will be placing the applicator. Here I will be speaking about superinductive system and how it works on myostimulation. Interaction of the electromagnetic field within the neuromuscular tissue results in nerve depolarization and muscle contractions. Based on the selected simulation frequency, muscle strengthening can be achieved. In the next slide, I will demonstrate to you how muscle strengthening can be achieved. In this video, I will be demonstrating how to use the superinductive system and how it works on muscle strengthening. We will be placing the applicator at the quadriceps of the patient. I will be loosening the six joint arm and placing it on the patient's thigh and proceed to lock the arm in place. Meanwhile, I will go on to be setting the protocol for muscle strengthening. You will be able to see involuntary motor movement of the patient from the SIS. This is good for patients who are athletic and also for patients with neurological issue. The much closer the applicator, the more intense the contractions are. This is a great tool that can be used for a wide variety of conditions as you can see. Hi everyone, my name is Vini. I'm a product specialist in BTL Malaysia. So today I'm going to talk about spasticity reduction by using a BTL superinductive system. Let me start with spasticity first. So spasticity is an involuntary muscle movement or a tightening that is caused by central nervous system injuries like spinal cord injury or a traumatic brain injury. Although we don't really know the exact mechanism, but we know that the injury to the spinal cord causes a disruption in the very complex uh, nerve circuit of the brain and spine that controls the entire reflex motor activity. When the brain and the spinal cord uh, can no longer communicate uh, normally with the rest of the body, the muscle controlled by the injured part of the spinal cord can become overactive. So in this situation, we can see some abnormal movements like exaggerated uh, reflexes, uh, like increased muscle tension or tightening of the muscle, uncontrolled muscle jerking and also like clonus. Uh, how does SIS or superinductive system help in this kind of situation? So BTL superinductive system uh, using a high intensity uh, electromagnetic field and also it uses high power which is 2.5 Tesla. So it will actually targets the neuromuscular tissues and induces 
electric currents which can depolarize neurons resulting in concentric muscle contraction. So the high intensity electromagnetic field in depth penetration and the stimulation of the entire area resulting in antispastic effect. So BDL uh, superinductive system uh, consists of nine minutes of spasticity reduction program. So this program, we can divide it into two sections. So in the first protocol section, antispastic effect on the agonistic muscle will achieve. So it also affects the spinal level of muscle tone control. In the second section, facilitatory effects on the antagonistic muscle will achieve. So apart from that, the protocol causes higher blood perfusion on the particular exposed region and it will also lead to circulation and also trophic improvement. So we will see the demonstration uh, of the uh, spasticity reduction program in the next slide. This video will demonstrate how to reduce the spasticity of upper extremity using BTL superinductive system. So firstly, uh, we have to examine the muscle tone of the patient's forearm to define the spasticity of the wrist flexor. And the second thing is uh, place the applicator above the area that to be treated. Uh, the device can easily position by means of the six joint arm, which allows uh, precise setting. So after that, proceed to the selecting protocols corresponding to the desired effects, which is uh, spasticity reduction. After we pressing start, adjust the intensity to the above motor threshold. So let the therapy run for a minute. So I will start the video. So this is the effect that we can see after we start the therapy. So in the first protocol section here, uh, antiseptic uh, effects on the agonistic muscle is achieved. Okay. At the same time, it also affects the spinal level of muscle tone control. In this slide, uh, I will show the facilitatory uh, effects on the antagonist muscle. Let me start the video. Okay, here I'm actually repositioning the applicator for the second part of the therapy. So this time, uh, the antagonistic uh, extensa group will be treated. So um, here I'm continuously pressing start and initiate the therapy again. So it will run for another eight minutes. So in the second section, the antagonistic extensor group uh, muscle are facilitated. Together with that, uh, the reciprocal inhibition of the flexor spasticity reduction will achieve. Okay, so these are the effects on the antagonist group of muscle. Next, I'm going to talk about breathing enhancement uh, using BTL superinductive system. So here, the high intensity electromagnetic field interact within the neuromuscular tissue. So this will result in nerve depolarization and muscle contraction. So based on the selected uh, stimulation frequency one, we can actually um, can either facilitate the muscle or strengthen them up. So in this protocol, uh, we also have myostimulative uh, effects on the muscle or in a group of muscle. So since all of us are facing a pandemic, okay, so this can be a best and also safest uh, treatment method because it's a non-contactable treatment method for post-COVID patients. So superinductive system helps in coordinate the breathing pattern for post-COVID patients. So in the next slide, uh, I will show the demonstration of breathing enhancement program. In this video, I will show the breathing enhancement program by using BTL superinductive system. So here before I start, right, I have to explain two things to the patient. 
one is the positioning of the patient has to be a very comfortable position so i have positioned him in a side lying because my applicator placement will be on the dorsolateral of the thoracic region the second thing is uh, i have to explain uh, the treatment procedure to the patient so that he will have an idea throughout the uh, treatment what to expect actually all right so let me start the video now okay so i have actually placed the applicator on the dorsolateral of the thoracic uh, region all right so now i'm actually setting the parameter and as you all can hear the sound i already start the treatment so here um, the protocol will have a myostimulative effects so i'm actually stimulating the breathing muscle so as you all can see the movement yeah so and also throughout the uh, treatment session you will have different type of frequency that will also actually uh, will avoid the muscle adaptation all right so in the next slide i will show the uh, placement of the applicator so this is the picture shows the position of the applicator so this position is on the uh, thoracic region and it's on the dorsolateral side so um, as i explained before for the post covid patients we can actually place the applicator in a non contactable way so that is very uh, safest way of treatment actually so this is uh, one of the case study for uh, breathing enhancement program by using VTL superinductive system. So we have a patient with combination of obstructive and restrictive uh, respiratory disease. So the total number of uh, treatment that have been done is 15 times SIS treatment and also uh, three times in a week they have done the treatment actually. So the result is significant increase of inspiration and expiration volume. So the proof you can see at the site here all the spirometry evaluation before and after we can see the improvement over here for an example uh, fvc is the force vital capacity the total volume of air that can be exhaled during the maximal force of expiration so that is also improved you can see uh, before the treatment is 4.64 after the treatment is 4.82 so the next one is uh, fev uh, first expiratory volume okay so that one also 3.29 before the treatment after the treatment is 3.58 so the improvement we can see over here almost all the evaluation the, the spirometry evaluation we can see the improvement over the side so i would say this is one of the successful uh, case study that we have done all right as any other um, electromodalities, BTL superinductive system also have contraindication. The first one is uh, any metal implants or any electronic implants. Uh, it can be a conductor for electromagnetic field. That is the main reason why uh, we cannot, um, you know, apply on the uh, direct on the implants actually. Uh, and then the next one is growth uh, plate area, also a contraindication. The third one is uh, head area. Head area because uh, we cannot uh, apply the electromagnetic field direct on the brain. That is the reason why it's contraindicated. It might disrupt the uh, brain activity. That is the reason. Heart area, heart uh, and also uh, blood disorders also a contraindicator directly place the applicator on the heart is a total contraindication which is not advisable also drug pumps also a contraindication malignant tumors also indication because it's a cancerous malignant tumor is cancerous so it can spread uh, the cell can spread very fast so we don't want to uh, you know promote that that is the reason okay on the cancerous patient uh, or uh, we must check the history of the patient. So on the cancerous patient, we cannot use a uh, beta superinductive system. Fever, as commonly we cannot use on uh, like, you know, electromagnetic field. So fever is one of the co contraindication. Uh, then pregnancy, I think almost for all the electrotherapy, pregnancy is contraindication. So for ETL SIS also, uh, pregnancy is a contraindication. Okay. 
So here in this slide, I would like to share the strongest point and also the advanced features of BTL superinductive system. First is the highest maximum stimulation intensity. So the intensity level in BTL uh, superinductive system, we can actually go to maximum level. Okay, and it also because of the power, the power is 2.5 Tesla, right? So it can reach different level of tissues in our body. And also it can target different level of pain management as well. All right. And then the next one is smart preset. We have a preset program. For all the preset programs, it's safe to use on your patient because it's already been tested by our R&D team and we have the clinical studies for it also. So all the preset uh, that we have, the programs that we have, it is safe to use. And uh, another uh, reason of it also, it helps and also it ease the end user to actually learn a lot of things, something like a guidance for them also to actually set the parameters. Okay, the next one is the applicator. The applicator is actually a six arm joint applicator. So it is very, very easy to handle. All right. And also it's very, very ergonomic at the same time. With the applicator, you can actually, it's an operator free basically. So it will allow you to easily, uh, you know, like place the applicator on the to be uh, treated area. All right, patented from inside out. So all the technical features, right? So it's already patented from inside out. So the next one is ability to work continuously due to cool flow technology and intensity protector. So basically, <clears throat> the coil cooling system and intelligent software function, uh, it will allow the uh, most effective cooling and ensure the possibility to have a prolonged therapy time. So even when set to values causing highest load on the device also. All right. The next one is equipped with pulse quality monitor, which ensure smooth operation of the device and monitor each pulses. So this is one of the advanced features in BTL also. So all these points, I would say it's very, very strongest point of BTL superinductive system. And these are the reasons why you need to have superinductive system in your own place. All right. In this slide, I will share about a case study of high intensity electromagnetic stimulation in post traumatic edema. And this was conducted uh, in Charles University in Prague, Faculty of Physical Education and Sport Czech Republic. Uh, this case study was done on a patient with a fracture of IP joint and the aim is to reduce post-traumatic edema and support fracture healing process. So the method of treatment by using superinductive system. So the treatment done for 13 times and it was done daily on the patient. So the evaluation method that they use was x-ray. So the result X-ray showed reduced edema in the affected area and patient reported additional pain relief. So in the picture shows the, the swollen um, IP joint. All right. And then the X-ray also shows the bone remodeling uh, after the treatment. So here, uh, the high intensity electromagnetic field enhances blood circulation in the affected area and support uh, the formation of the vascular and cartilage callus. Consequently, the cartilage progressively mineralizes and the bone remodels. The next case study is about repetitive peripheral inductive stimulation in comprehensive therapeutic approach. So this case study done on a patient with post-traumatic respiratory disease and musculoskeletal disorder. The aim is to improve ventilation parameter and to treat musculoskeletal system. The method using four weeks of therapeutic protocol. Evaluation method was uh, spirometry and kinesiology evaluation. The result, uh, significant improvement in majority 
possibility of ventilation parameters. So here, the therapy stimulates the intercostal respiratory muscle and using amplitude modulated pulses with different carrier frequency. And the contraction are achieved by stimulating the neuromuscular tissue. In the next slide, I will show the, uh, the result table of this case study. So this is the result for the previous case study. So in the first picture, we can see the uh, mole alignment of body posture and its uneven posture also. So uh, after the treatment of BTL superinductive system, we can see the significant changes in body alignment. So here, BTL superinductive system by using the breathing enhancement program, it relaxes the tightened muscles. Uh, at the same time, the next table shows the results of spirometry evaluation. Uh, the first column and then the prediction ECCS is actually a standardization for lung function test for European. So looking at the improvement percentage in conclusion a BTL superinductive system helps in improve and coordinate the breathing pattern as well. Right? So with that case study basically summarizes our presentation today from BTL. I hope it was beneficial for all doctors, physiotherapists, clinicians with, clinicians with us today to get an idea regarding the contactless technology superinductive system, which is helpful for both patients and the user. We thank you and we appreciate the time that you keep up with us during this whole webinar session. Please do not hesitate to reach us out for any inquiries regarding superinductive system or any other pain management modalities that you wish to consider. That is uh, the number on the screen and the email address. And after this, we will open the session for question and answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to um, Miss Audrey and Miss Vinnie just now for the information about uh, the super induction systems and also uh, the contraindication and the usage. Uh, I actually saw a lot of uh, participants asking regarding uh, the side effect and also the contraindications. I think uh, just now uh, uh, the, the PowerPoint just now, the presentation just now already answered most of the questions. And now we will move to uh, Q and A questions um, for all the three uh, speakers. Okay, we will start with Prof Halim in, uh, first. Is that okay, Prof Halim? Okay, I'm okay. Thanks. So, sure. okay. Please so, sure. uh, I I will show you the slide I prepare. Okay. So, uh, the first question is from Neon. Neon Zi Hui Tan, she would like to know what do you think about people who play golf, eccentric injury in non-contact sport, mainly which muscle are at risk of injuries? Right, thank you very much, uh, Neon. Right. So for golf uh, golfers, uh, commonly they have uh, back pain or they complain of back pain and actually shoulder pain. And if you relate to eccentric injuries here, it's actually more likely to be related to the uh, shoulder pain. And uh, it can be either the supraspinatus, it can also be the biceps tendon. And uh, these are the two likely upper limb uh, problems. Uh, but the lower limb, oh, sorry, for the back, then this is actually related to either muscle strain or it can also relate it to age-related lumbar spondylosis. And uh, for the lower limb, we probably have heard of uh, ACL injuries happening as well. This is actually the acute one, which uh, is very much related to actually pivoting uh, maneuver in, uh, in uh, golfing. Uh, so I hope I have answered that question. Uh, shall I go on to the next one, uh, Shum? Or... Okay. You asked about can tendinitis be a precipitating factor uh, for tendinosis. Thank you very much, you. Uh, this is a nice question. So I enjoy it. But uh, in general, and very likely, tendinitis does not 
specificity to taninosis. They are uh, in a way two separate entities um, and they are not related generally. They may be related indirectly because they are all uh, talking about tendon uh, problem, but taninitis uh, usually uh, they are short-lived. They are uh, the outcome of treatment is usually uh, excellent, but when it comes to tendinosis, these are more long-standing, and uh, treatment uh, will be a little bit more complicated because they do, don't. They tend not to actually respond to treatment uh, as good as uh, tendinitis. And uh, to talk about biomechanically, they don't really actually. Um, I mean, like tendinitis leading to tendinosis. Uh, I think I've actually, uh, in my lecture earlier, I showed you several risk factors uh, that actually predispose to tendinosis. If you remember, there isn't actually anything uh, about tendinitis. Uh, so indirectly, you know, for example, if someone treats um, tendinitis with uh, steroid, for example, uh, yeah, that may actually uh, lead on later towards uh, tendinosis. Um, is there any difference in terms of treatment for tenosis, tenitis, and paratenonitis? Uh, yes and no. Uh, for your information, uh, tenitis, uh, you know, all of this, we can always start with physiotherapy. That would be uh, an easy answer to say those are the common things that we do. But when it comes to uh, tenitis, uh, the treatment for tenitis is actually more like a short term, brief. Uh, uh, a brief and quick um, uh, fix. Uh, but for tenosis, it's usually long, longer term. Uh, for example, uh, eccentric training. Uh, Tenosis would benefit from uh, eccentric training so, uh, so well. Tenonitis, uh, although we don't say that, you know, uh, we should go for, or not shouldn't, shouldn't go for uh, eccentric training or eccentric exercise, uh, but uh, usually with your treatment, uh, they recover and this, uh, the, the uh, patients would actually go back to sports or work uh, without much problem. Now, somehow or other, uh, you, we just need to bear in mind as well that uh, they can actually, there can actually be both entities happening at the same time. Meaning that someone who's got tendinosis sometimes has got tendinitis when he presents to you. When they get uh, pain, uh, tendinosis, as I say, uh, commonly they are asymptomatic. And sometimes when you do an you know, ultrasound scan, when you assess them, you find that they, they've got some clinical features of tendinosis, but they don't have pain. So you cannot actually uh, diagnose them to have tendinitis. So someone with tendinitis sometimes do have tendinosis as well. Meaning that when you do an ultrasound scan, you will find some tendinotic features of uh, the particular tendon. Paratenonitis is actually uh, more so in the cases of tendinosis with an acute flare-up. I mean, they, they are tendinosis to begin with, and sometimes they get paratenonitis on top of that. And um, if you remember that I talked about tendinosis, which actually uh, pr promotes uh, neuro neovascularization and nerve, sorry, that means nerve and as well as uh, new vessels, um, proliferation. So these, these things can actually cause pain sometimes, and that can be due to uh, paratenon uh, inflammation. Uh, at the same time, in um, tenosynovium, for example, tenosynovitis, for example, which you have the paratenon as well as the synovial shift, both are inflamed. Remember, paratenon is just the layer just outside the uh, tendon substance itself, while the sheath actually encapsulates the whole tendon, including the paratenon. Uh, so, what is my opinion about practicing uh, treating tendon muscle injury with prolotherapy and PRP? Okay, so if, since you're asking me my opinion, so then I'll give you an answer of my opinion rather than the evidence uh, uh, in the literature. Yeah? So, you talk about uh, tendon, uh, sorry, PRP and prolotherapy. I've done both for tendon and even muscle uh, and both um, of these. And um, because of the evidence supports more of the PRP, I kind of like do PRP first. But I have done, uh, I've got patients who actually do not respond to PRP. And I, when I switch to prolotherapy, they actually respond. All right. And uh, when, we, when we started, when I started my sports medicine uh, specialty, uh, then we, we, we do more prolotherapy than PRP. And we 
also found that you know, my, my experience is that prolog therapy actually works. It's just that there's not much evidence or maybe not much study in terms of prolog therapy. So you just need to remember that prolog therapy started off with back pain and they actually started treatment of back pain um, with prolog therapy. Yeah? For PRP, there's lots of studies in terms of muscle and tendon. Uh, nevertheless, uh, right now, the, see, the more we study, the more we know. And whatever we learn today may actually be different tomorrow. So right now, um, the gist is that there's no conclusive evidence to support the use of PRP. And so, more so for prototherapy. So if you talk about evidence there, it's not really convincing. But in my practice, I do use them, especially if other things do not work. Okay, sure. Oh, there are okay. more questions, right? <laughs> Thank you, guys. That seems that, that means that you guys have been paying attention. <laughs> All right. How fast for elite footballers um, to recover from thigh, hamstring, groin, muscle, grade one injuries? Okay. And what needs to be done in the first few days? Okay. Here we talk about uh, hamstring uh, or even um, groin muscle. Okay. One thing you need to know about hamstring, you know, this is slightly different than the rest of the muscles. Hamstring, uh, although it's grade one, okay, commonly if you have muscle grade one uh, injury, they actually recover fast two to four weeks. But when it comes to hamstring, it is a bit tricky. Because hamstring, once you start loading on them, they may tend to re-break again. So I usually err on the safe side for hamstring. So I usually give them about four to six weeks before I actually get them to return to sport fully. Nevertheless, the trick is not actually about that particular time. There's no specific time. The, the trick is actually to gradually load them as you find that clinically they are okay. For example, you find that they are painless now, you should start loading them mildly, and then you then carry on, gradually increase that load. Okay, so hamstring is a bit tricky. Now, for any, um, uh, uh, some of the muscles that we have, for example, quadriceps is also tricky. It depends on where is the location. You remember about quadriceps, if it's proximal, then the prognosis is not so good, meaning that it takes longer time to recover. Groin muscle actually behaves somewhat similar to that, although there's not much study saying that it's really uh, depends on the location of the, the injury. But uh, uh, roughly speaking, for thigh and uh, groin, I usually give them about two to four weeks. Nevertheless, again, you know, the, the exact time is not really always exact, right? So you definitely need to, to, need to reassess again and again. So what needs to be done in the first few days? Uh, I talked about uh, price and I can see that uh, Candon's goal asks about peace, and uh, Lavina Chu as well talked about rice protocol. So maybe I can actually sum this, I mean, uh, answer these three together. So Lavina asks uh, about, we've got some news recently saying that rice protocol is outdated, is that true? And Candon's goal says that, what is your opinion on fairly new principle on acute soft tissue injuries management, which is peace? where it suggests to avoid anti-inflammatory modalities exercise, which may be potentially disrupt inflammation and, uh, the, and the rest, yeah? So, um, right, when you, we have uh, an injury in the first few days, I still use uh, actually price or the RISE protocol, which we add on what I mentioned just now, uh, optimal loading, which uh, people sometimes call them as the police, P-O-L-I-C. Um, what actually, there has been actually changes, correct? As what uh, Camden says, there's this new thing saying that anti-inflammatory, and this they mentioned about eyes, yeah? Anti-inflammatory is not really something that we do like, you know, like NSAID, it's not really part of, of rice. NSAID is not really part of uh, uh, sorry, ice. But the, 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 the whole um, idea is actually about anti-inflammation in the first uh, 24 to 48, uh, 24 to 48 hours, sorry. So when it talks about that, then we actually started off saying that NSAIDs is, is detrimental to, uh, to healing. So if that, uh, that is NSAID, so why not ice, right? Because ice is, has also an effect of that anti-inflammatory. So while I would like to say yes and no, I, we know that NSAIDs is actually, um, it's not just detrimental to the healing of the tendon and muscle uh, injury, it can also give you other side effects as well. But when it comes to eyes, there's actually um, uh, the growing, the, the evidence prior to this was actually a lot of that eyes can actually reduce pain. And to a certain extent, um, the blood flow to the particular area. So within the 24, 48 hours, I think it's good to actually control all those things. 
because uh, as a greater inflammation can actually cause more damage, right? So, but we are not talking about uh, putting someone on ice for a long time. Yep. This is just to actually control the pain. And if someone doesn't have pain, you don't really do the icing. So assuming someone has got the ankle uh, sprain and he's got no pain, so you can actually skip the icing. So still, uh, you can just maintain the rest of the thing though. Um, for the, uh, so when we say about these new ones like uh, uh, RISE protocol is outdated, it's actually not really outdated, it's just that it has been revised and uh, some of it has been uh, slightly altered. So for example, the PEACE one is actually AVOID, uh, the A stands for AVOID anti-inflammatory and they mentioned ICE specifically. Uh, this is very new, uh, I think it's in BMG. Uh, BMJS, I think. Uh, nevertheless, I think we all should as well wait and see um, for further uh, comments from um, you know the other experts as well, because the, there had been evidence prior to this that uh, um, ice helps. Anti-inflammatory, yeah. We generally speaking, we all uh, try to avoid. Okay, so the next one is uh, is tendinosis. I, sorry, uh, I sorry. think we missed. Yeah, going Chungji. Uh, is tendinosis is a sort of, uh, of like diagnosis of exclusion of suspected tendon injury? Well, actually not really. Um, we do have tendinosis that gives you pain. Uh, so um, see, uh, when we look at uh, someone who presents to you with a tendon injury, uh, we need to actually look through the history. Now, if it's actually acute pain, so the first thing that should come in your mind should be the tendonitis. And remember about unaccustomed activity and overloading or sudden overloading of uh, the particular tendon or the particular structure. Uh, those are very much like tendonitis. But if he's actually complaining for a long-standing mild pain uh, and uh, you should actually find in AC there's actually repetitive uh, loading of that particular area, then tendinosis would be your uh, diagnosis. So it's not actually an exclusion. It can be the first primary diagnosis. Uh, so I think that would answer that, yeah? Uh, Prof, coming back to the hamstring injuries, there's this, uh, uh, Daniel actually asked, why, can you further elaborate why injury at the proximal part of the hamstring uh, carry poorer prognosis? Okay, um, there have been studies that perhaps it's because of uh, the involvement of um, the bursa. There's an ischial bursa there, which actually complicates that healing. There's also another uh, the theory saying that um, the, um, where it actually uh, gets inserted to that particular area uh, of bone, for example, uh, it actually differs from one person to another. So any, any interface between, for example, bone and tendon, sorry, muscle and tendon, or tendon and bone, those are actually susceptible area for injury. Yeah, uh, I didn't actually go through much uh, to detail of, of this, but there is one part as well. That it's not about biceps, but sorry, it's not about hamstring, but it's about the other tendons. Uh, some of these tendons has got what we call hypovascular area, uh, although it has not been shown for the hamstring, but uh, well, uh, this hypovascularity can be a, a one of the reason as well, why some areas uh, has got poor prognosis as well. Shall we move on? Uh, we move on to a uh, question from Ro Roslan, no Roslan, eccentric contraction movement more risk to tendon injury. Does that mean eccentric strengthening exercise should be the last choice compared to the isotonic and concentric strengthening exercise? Thank you, no Roslan. She sounds like our friend Bunu. I, I know it's Bunu. <laughs> well, uh, coming back to this one, if you remember, I mentioned uh, one particular slide says that the study has shown that most, most likely the mechanism for this uh, tensile stretch uh, of the um, of, um, uh, hamstring injury or any tendon injury is probably because of the eccentric contraction or it happens during this particular phase of uh, eccentric contraction where so much of force is being generated and this particular tendon could not take it. So it goes above the threshold. Yes, it is true then uh, eccentric uh, contraction may be the cause. But I also mentioned in the one slide that despite that, studies have shown that eccentric training is also protective against this. It's just like if you know that's a weakness, you retrain them or you train them 
on that particular part, then they will become stronger. So they will be able to take the centric force better. So, uh, so yeah, so if you say it should be the last choice, okay, sorry, I didn't answer this properly. So if she says that would it be the last compared to isometric and concentric? Now, that doesn't really mean that um, I would put, yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, it is true that I put isometric first and then concentric and then last as uh, eccentric. That's a general rule. Now, the main reason is because of the generation force. Uh, sorry, the force of generation because of the centric contraction. Yeah, I mean, uh, we actually put it at the last, but uh, nevertheless, right now, uh, we also change in many things. We sometimes introduce eccentric a bit earlier as well. It's not always a hard and fast rule. Uh, it must be at the last one. It's just, um, it's just like balance and proprioception. It's never last, actually. It's always, uh, we try to actually introduce this early as well. Uh, but we must be uh, mindful that eccentric generates more force. Actually, oh yeah, that reminds me of eccentric chain. Um, uh, close kinetic. Uh, as well. Will be May and the thing, yeah. I'll carry uh, what is, uh, yeah. I would do that. The patient requires your patient and control, give it. And I think you're breaking up, Halim. Yeah, Pro Prof, Prof Halim, your line is not clear. Probably we can move to the uh, second uh, speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank Prof. Halim. Uh, Prof Halim? Yes, thank you. Yep. Are you okay to answer the remaining of the questions? Uh, can you hear me well now? Yeah, yeah. We, okay, we can. Great. okay, So my answer to NCH is just now is that, yeah, we still do if the patient requires. So you must be very wary of what does the patient really need. If he cannot sleep because of the pain, then sometimes he needs that quality of uh, life, all right? So, and uh, the studies that I've seen that have shown that NSAIDs is actually bad for the healing, it's actually about when we use the NSAIDs for a long time. So anything less than one week is actually okay. But here we, we commonly say two to three days, that's good enough. And sometimes two to three days, PRM basics. So yeah, I still use NSAIDs if the patient requires that. Uh, and then Fariza wants to confirm the best position for doing uh, ice therapy for cordyceps. Yeah, should, should it be position, stretching position or minimal pain position? All right, I haven't come across any specific uh, position that will be best for uh, icing, right? Uh, in fact, we just, uh, so yeah, I wouldn't have any answer for this, meaning that I don't mind doing any of this as long as the patient is comfortable. Okay. Wow. So we, you know, is that okay for the rest of my colleagues, speakers? I think this is the yeah. I think this is the last one. Okay. Right. Uh, there's a repetitive of questions uh, okay. regarding price, police, and also rice uh, okay. asked by No Hidayah and also uh, Shavaya. Yeah. Uh, between price, police, protocol, which is better to advise to the patients? So I think number 13 and 14, but I mean, Nur Hidayah and Shafawi, I think I have answered, Shawafi, sorry, Shawafi. I've answered that. Um, so I would still use them. It's just that uh, what they do now is actually they modify. And the only thing that a question now, the additional reason is whether ice is detrimental or not. So for that one, I would still, for the time being, I would still say, yes, you should actually do it. You don't have to actually change anything. You can add on with whatever they have actually add on because like police, which is optimal loading, which is good. Remember I talked about rest, it's not good. It's relative rest or active rest, which is good. That's actually optimal loading. Uh, the, the, the more, the bigger question later on will be what is optimal? So which is, is not un, well answered now. So let the study go on and then let them actually advise us further later, okay? So I think, uh, yeah, I think we have answered 13 and 14. I'm going to go for number 15. Yeah. Dr. Lim want to ask about uh, 
he thanked you for the excellent presentations. He wanted to ask about uh, the dry needling, group of dry, dry needling in, in uh, athletes with hamstring spasm or, or reduced port meter angle, uh, uh, which also may be have, having an uh, intrinsic predisposed to strain. Uh, what are the adjunctive role of dry needling in imparting some element of myofascial release? So, this, this has got a few parts though, but they are combined, I think. That's what Lim is trying to say. Uh, number one is about hamstring spasm. And whether hamstring spasm, when you, because uh, hamstring spasm, or fle poor flexibility, like, it's not really spasm itself. Flexibility would actually uh, increase risk of hamstring strain or hamstring tear. Yeah? And then, so that if we treat that by using dry needling, whether would it actually be success, uh, sorry, whether is it successive <coughs> or single? Okay, so for for my uh, answer on this one is actually um, dry needling. If it can actually help to reduce the the, uh, the rigidity or the stiffness of the hamstring, go ahead. Of course, I've done that as well. But I don't treat that specifically to actually reduce the risk of hamstring strain. I usually actually use a lot of other modalities for, for that one, stretching and all that. I only actually start doing dry needling uh, when they have problems rather than uh, before they have problems. I mean, you know, it's, for example, if you know hamstring tightness is an issue, you do the stretching, you actually push it further. But uh, really for me, I, would, uh, I wouldn't actually do uh, either uh, myofascial release or even uh, dry needling. So I hope I actually answered that. And I think probably people have got different opinions in this one. But uh, my take on this one, if you have uh, the least uh, aggressive one, the, the more conservative one, try that one first. Thank you. Yeah, can I just jump in one thing about uh, the, the early mobilization and all the, the rationale behind it? I think it makes sense to mobilize early. The simple reason is because uh, in areas of injury, there will be scarring, okay? Like all injuries, they will remodel. It is the remodeling that is important because uh, the collagen fibers during the scar healing process is like, it's disorganized. It's all in all different directions. And if you mobilize the patient early when the pain is reasonably under control, then these collagen fibers reorganize themselves in the direction of the forces that is uh, exerted. So it will heal in a more appropriate direction and it will pr provide a better range of motion and less stiffness. So, so that's one of the reasons why we want to mobilize patients early. Uh, as regards to anti-inflammatories, I find it very useful in my clinical practice. I still do that. And my impression is that it doesn't actually make much difference in terms of, of uh, delay in healing the, the, uh, or even non-healing uh, non of any uh, ligaments as a result of uh, all this, uh, or soft tissue injury as a result of uh, injury. The, it is the, the extent and severity of the injury will predict the outcome in my mind. Uh, because if there's like a grade three, grade four, uh, you know, injury of the ligaments, no matter what you do, it's not going to heal, very likely to heal well in any case. So, so those are the reasons why uh, it's been, that also the studies itself is also not very, um, uh, very conclusive in many ways. But, well, we'll wait and see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we move on to the question for the second speaker, Ram. While we're waiting, maybe I can ask Ram one question. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Um, what, what do you do with patients who have implants in? I know you said that they are, you got to be very careful in one of your, your slides and, and your comments, but we do use titanium implants. Yep. Okay, doctor. So what do you uh, think? Uh, see, for titanium is uh, in the periodic table, they are low conductivity of electricity. So, uh, comparatively with other metals, um, so when we use it in a safe way, I mean directly on the titanium and lower intensity, and we check with the patients on their comfort level as long as they are not feeling discomfort. Um, from I believe because generally electrotherapy, all electrotherapy modalities. Uh, contraindicated for, for, for metal implants, but when we know it's titanium uh, in a very low intensity, it should be okay. Because uh, being an orthopedic surgeon, we see patients with non-union bones that is fractured that doesn't unite. 
yeah. usually you cannot remove the implant and, and you don't want to stimulate the bone to heal. Yes. So, uh, if, if it can be used for this sort of situation, it'll be great. Correct. You can use it because, again, uh, if you're looking at the properties of titanium, it's um, very low conductivity of electricity and in the periodic, periodic table, it's, 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 um, so it doesn't conduct electricity. I, I don't think so. Titanium will conduct electricity. Correct me if I'm wrong, Prof or Dr. Chan, but so uh, looking into that, so we are able to use this uh, electro electromagnetic stimulation on on the titanium, on the implant side, on the non-union fracture union side, so it, to stimulate, but for a shorter duration and very low intensity. Audrey, do you have any answer for that? Can uh, the super induction used in the titanium implant? Okay, so for as far as um, our side, conductivity for titanium is completely fine, like Mr. Ram was saying, because it's paramagnetic, so the conductivity is quite low. Because also for MRI patients, they can use, they can go for MRI even though they have titanium. So our machine, if we use it for titanium, it's completely fine. But like Mr. Ram was saying, we have, when you use it at that specific area, just use it at low intensity and always ask the patient's feedback. That is most important. But for things that are ferromagnetic, that they are like nickel or iron that get heated up, that we would avoid completely because even though the um, electromagnetic, you don't feel it when you put the superinductive system, no heat or anything, but internally the metal implant inside will start heating up. That could cause burns. So that will work completely avoid. But like Mr. Ram was saying, titanium is completely fine. But of course, always getting the patient's feedback while doing the machine is the best way to also check with them. That was why I asked because in, in, in the, for an MRI machine, a 1.5 yes. Tesla is much less than your 2.5. Correct. Uh, and, and we do use it for patients who the MRI is, is compatible. Titanium is compatible for MRI. Yep. So, yes. so that's the reason. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so we continue with the questions to Ram uh, from Muhammad Aizad. How do you decide when or what types of injury to use either ice therapy or hot therapy? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Elston, Dr. Prof. Uh, Halim and Dr. Chan, and also to all the questions. Uh, from Muhammad Aizad, um, when I decide to use uh, ice therapy and hot therapy, on ice therapy, I use it on acute cases. I agree with Prof. Halim on this because my reason to do ice is to have early mobilization, again, I agree to Dr. Chan, as early as possible, we need to mobilize. For example, if you're having a, 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 a swelling on your elbow, we need to uh, mobilize as soon as possible. But when during there is inflammation, ROM is limited. So I would use ice, number one, to reduce the pain, and number two, to improve ROM. So this is what uh, I would use ice for. And then for heat back or hot therapy, I would use on more chronic cases, low back or a very long period of hamstring tightness, I would use uh, hot therapy. So basically, uh, in a nutshell, I would use ice therapy on acute cases and I would use hot therapy on chronic cases. Okay. And then moving on to the next question, what are the contraindications? Uh, thank you, Patish. Uh, what are the contraindications for using these machines? Is the same like other electrotherapy machines. Um, it's a little bit different uh, with this, the contraindications are a little bit. Uh, I think BTL has, uh, Audrey has shown to everybody what are the contraindications and indication to use this uh, pain management, improve ROM and what every other electrotherapy does. But this does 80% better than any other electrotherapy does. And then, uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, is there any side effects for clients when using SIS machine? And is there any contraindication? The contraindication is the same, but uh, side effects during treatment, uh, they feel a little bit discomfort. Uh, number one is because of the sound. And number two is because of the contraction of the muscle and because they are surprised at, at my, my players, they're surprised because most of my electrotherapy modalities or all my electrotherapy modalities, I have skin contact or some sort of a contact. But with this, they have no contact, so they are feeling discomfort uh, mentally, psychologically. So this affects the treatment method. 
but over the period of time, maybe after two to three sessions, they feel really comfortable and they have good response to this. And then to thank you, one Muhammad Izam, what is the alternative uh, of IceBud post football match in following MTN SOP during pandemic area? Okay, this is a question that I'm practicing and we are practicing in Slango FC. So we buy individual uh, ice bucket or tow from the water tank, the blue water tank, which is until your chest level. And then uh, to, to reduce, I, I will tell you uh, two methods. One is uh, cost saving method. And the second one is um, we cannot avoid this because of the SOP. All football teams, all football clubs are affected with this. But the first method I would use, I would fill up uh, cold water and then put ice inside. And then while they're taking a shower, they will take a bucket of uh, cold water and, and immerse in it. I mean, not immerse, but shower in it for 10 to 15 minutes. So when they are feeling not so cold, then they do it again. So it's almost same, but not as effective as ice baths. So this is what I do. And we have the social distancing. They're not going to immerse in the same uh, swimming pool. You know, the small swimming pool you all are using, you're not going to immerse in the same area. It's cleaner and it's safer. The second one, uh, that I use is uh, the same blue color tank, water tank. It's like until your chest level, it goes inside all the waste paper, uh, waste, uh, rubbish bin uh, that I put in. So individual goes in. So we change the water and the ice every time the player goes in. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next question. One, Muhammad Izam, what is, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, sorry, uh, Katra Zina. Thank you. Uh, can you please, due to the presence of EM field, uh, would there be associated contraindication? Again, uh, contraindication, uh, the main contraindication that I, I, I found out with this machine is um, for the patient, client, and for yourself, I'm sure you know pregnancy and all that. But also, you have to be sure because it's a strong electromagnetic field. The same rule applies to uh, before you're going to an MRI machine, no credit card, no handphone, no in any electronics. So in this, I would have a very one-to-one -one, uh, session with the player so that without them using their handphones or with their electronic device. Okay. Next question, Zulkarnain Jaffa. Thank you for your question. Uh, managing hamstring injuries, how would you plan your rehabilitation, the structures of posterior oblique sling? Uh, just a brief introduction to posterior oblique sling. It's a group of muscle or chain of muscle that uh, finishes from your back, that finishes in your gluteal region. So talking about hamstring injury, everything is related. So uh, you have to first of all check your uh, internal obliques, uh, external obliques, uh, your, your quadricep, uh, quad, quadricep lumbarum, uh, which is the deep structure of your, 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 your core muscle. So first of all, identify which are the weakened structure. So I'm sure with this, uh, if you're having a hamstring injury and if you're relating to the post, uh, you might be having a uh, uh, weakness of your gluteus and tightness of your ITB. So these are the indications of it. So I would actually train the gluteus muscle and release, uh, do a manual therapy or now I'm using uh, SIS to actually release the tightness of the low back muscle. And then I can strengthen uh, the gluteus, and then I would get great results for the hamstring mobilization and also strengthening, I mean, uh, before touching the hamstring, before I load the hamstring. Uh, Jacqueline, thank you for your question. The machine seems rather noisy. Uh, can you know, we cannot control the sound because this is the vibration of the magnet. So if you have experienced the MRI, also it's noisy. It also is noisy, you can't control. So as you increase the intensity uh, of the machine, we would get, the sound gets louder. So this is, uh, I believe, I mean, BT also can answer this for me. Uh, I believe it's the vibration of the magnet. You should give them headphones with music to soothe them. Thank <laughs> you, doctor. <laughs> yeah, but no, 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 no electronic devices near the machine. That is one, one problem. We might, BTL should find another option for yeah. this, I think. <laughs> Anis, uh, may I ask, what should we do if a person keeps having fatigue muscle, even though we have done the PNF to stretch the muscle, even we already gave the person stretching, exercise, release the tightness, 
the person is still having myofascial pain syndrome on deltoid muscle. Um, well, uh, first of all, we, before you do any stretching, try to see whether he has limited ROM, try to track the other muscle structures around it, whether he's having uh, OA or any capsule injuries or diagnosing is the most important before you do any procedure or any method. If you're not sure, uh, please refer them to a doctor because this question is very general because he's still uh, having myofascial, so might have another factor of this. So again, uh, I would love to see this person physically and, and I'm able to answer because by just reading this, um, we have a lot of probability. Maybe he has a fracture, maybe he has a torn muscle. There's a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, indications. So I'm so sorry that I'm not be able to answer these questions directly, but you have my number. So maybe we can do a video call and I would, or maybe we would do another arrangement for me to actually see this uh, person of uh, the, this patient of yours. So I will do this for you. Okay, uh, Mr. Deva, how many of these machines are being used in Malaysia? I would leave DTL to answer this question. And same from Mr. Deva, thank you for your question. What is your experience in treating OA in the treatment of, is the treatment comfortable? Is, is, it, is there contact during treatment with EMS? Uh, yes, there is no, uh, the, the treatment is very comfortable. Um, I don't treat directly, again, I don't treat directly on the knee joint. I treat on the quadriceps region and also I focus on the ha hamstring region, uh, region because um, on elderly OA, I've treated this with this uh, SIS. I have amazing results because the muscle is activated. They have better ROM, but again, OA is degenerative changes on, 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 on the patient. So the pain has been reduced and improved in ROM. That's all I've achieved, but not clear the pain or improve tremendously, no. To be very honest with you, I've achieved, uh, uh, I've reduced the pain and improved the ROM. So they have a better lifestyle right after that. And may, uh, is the improvement of ROM of the patient sustained after the treatment? How many sessions? I think this question is referring to my video. Um, he's also a physiotherapist and he's been having this pain for the past 15 years. He has done um, Thai kickboxing and he has sustained um, injury. And due to the scarring of the tissue and limited of ROM, he had joint stiffness. So the protocol that I used was um, uh, uh, joint, mobi joint mobility on, 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 on the preset protocol and also to improve uh, muscle relaxation. And then after that, I proceed with muscle strengthening uh, the preset protocol by the machine. And then what you saw by what my method is, I increase the intensity to uh, 100%, which is also 2.5 Tesla, also 150 Hertz, just for one minute. Um, uh, I've tried that on myself. And now I've decided to do it on, on, on the patient, on the uh, client. And I had immediate, after one session, I had immediate uh, improvement, but to be honest with you, this uh, improvement was not permanent. So to achieve uh, to achieve like permanent or better improvement for, for a longer period, the treatment needs to be done more frequent. I did it like two to three times a day for five days a week, like uh, not continuously, but skip, 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 like. Uh, alternating days like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like five five times in a week, alternating times. So where I found really really good improvement on 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 uh, the patient that you saw in my video earlier. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for your wonderful answers. I hope. I hope uh, I answered all the uh, questions uh, to the participants. And if, again, if there's any other uh, questions or anything, you all can contact me directly in terms of application of this machine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Chong. Yeah, we we'll move on to the uh, questions for the third speaker. So, um, yeah, um, 
Okay. So probably uh, Audrey can answer this. Uh, how much is it cost for this machine and any study done so far uh, comparing SIS to other electrotherapy agents? All right. So uh, thank you for the questions. So for the cost, I think it's best for you all to email us, drop us an email so you can talk about the cost of it. All right. And for comparing SIS to other uh, electrotherapy agents, yes, we have studies about that. We can also, what I can do is if you drop me an email, I can send you all the studies. But of course, we are using SIS is a whole different a mechanism of it. So we're using electromagnetic field and then electrotherapy is using current. So yes, we have comparisons. We have studies for that as well. So if you want the studies, please just email me. We can get through with it more further. All right. And then we have a question for Dr. Chan. So Sorry. I think we already answered that. Yeah, we already answered okay. that. So yes, um, about cost per session, it honestly depends um, on how much the clinic wants to. We also have to understand that superinductive system is fairly new in the market, in Malaysia at least. Not many people uh, have it. So the pricing depends on your clientele and the setting you have. We don't have, uh, we don't actually imply to the, our clients how much they want to charge the patients. They can go through packages or they can do it per sessions. It's up to them. But of course, being the uh, only machine here so far that it has all different features, we would say it's a higher end machine. So the pricing would definitely be a bit more on the higher end. Mm, okay. uh, it's affordable. I mean, uh, I would want, sorry, uh, this one. I'm not promoting uh, anything, but um, our place uh, in the future that we are setting up would be very affordable for everyone to be introduced to SIS. So yeah, I we uh, haven't decided the costing yet, but it would be very affordable just to bring back athletes and, and, and people who are who's in problem. Uh, so yeah. Great. So yeah, based on that, so we give um, complete freedom to our clients <laughs> to go on the pricing. It definitely, like how every other center has a different pricing for all the electrotherapy as well. We give complete freedom for that. Great. All um, right. Okay. Um, third question, does superinductive system cause cancer? No, it does not cause cancer. But one of the contraindications are cancer because it will activate the cancer cells and it will spread it more further. So yes, if you have cancer, a malignant cancer or tumor, and then you put the SIS, yes, it will conduct the cells, it will activate the cells more, correct? But it does not cause cancer. And the fourth question is, is there any randomized control trial done? Okay, we have clinical studies and randomized control trials that are done. So if you are interested to get those, just drop an email to BTL, we will send it to you, or you can email me also. I will send it to you personally. Is the SIS therapy carries any risks? I think um, carrying risks, not really, because this is the only therapy you would say that can do all sorts of different, um, can target all sorts of different pains. Also can do for pain management. We can also do it for muscle stimulation, strengthening. Risks, I think, depends on how the um, therapist puts it on the patient. I think your assessment and your diagnosis is the most important. Whichever therapist that is doing this, if they assess wrongly or if they don't check properly the client and put it on the client wrongly, then that carries risks. But that comes back to the therapist itself. But using the machine, there is no risk because using this modality, we don't have heat or anything of such. So there's no risk of burning or even like, ice burns or coal burns, nothing like that. But I think the most important is the therapist. In the end of the day, we have to understand that this is still a machine. We still need the therapist to do their job and diagnose and get the assessment right. That is the most important. I think any treatment without the correct diagnosis and um, like assessment will carry risks for sure. All right. Does the seventh question, does the SIS therapy hurt? I would say it doesn't hurt but you do feel contractions and it may feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it's not painful. You would feel like someone like having like a bit of a grab on you, but it's also depending, we have different frequencies and intensities in the machine. Uh, 
Of course, the higher the intensity and frequency, they would feel more contractions and that might feel uncomfortable, but it does not feel pain in any way. So um, how many sessions will I need for the SIS therapy? So it depends. This depends on the client itself, on their condition itself. I cannot give uh, exact, because some it works faster on some people and it works longer on some people. But for minimal um, acute, for acute conditions, minimal, we would ask you to have five sessions to have significant difference. And for chronic conditions, to try at least 10 times until you see significant improvement. It may vary. It may be more or less, depending on the patient's condition, their age as well. All right. And how does SIS work on fracture healing? Okay, this is an interesting one. We have to understand that our bone healing process, it does not cut short the time for the fracture healing process, but it does boost the circulation, blood circulation, hence we can have better recovery in that sense. But does not mean if you have a fracture, it's going to heal within one month or so. No, it does not shorten the time, but it that helps boost. So it will grow, uh, it will still take the time needed. But also for uh, fracture healing, we have the cast on top. Sometimes certain things we have cast and you can use this machine over the cast for also pain management. So that's the interesting about, thing about SIS because when patients, when they have fracture, most of them are in cast if they're not in fixations. You can use this to also keep their muscles stimulated. So when you take off the cast, their rehabilitation is faster. So that's the other way also we can use SIS for fractures. Can I just add, uh, I think yes. there's, there's evidence that uh, particularly for non-union, uh, or delayed union that these uh, magnetic therapy does actually work. The only problem in Malaysia is not covered by insurance. That's the biggest headache. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Okay, thank you, doctor. So, uh, number 10, what happens after the treatment with SIS? So, usually what happens is you may see a little bit of redness. That's because of the blood circulation. And then you will have a little bit of like numbness because you have to understand we are working with the nerves and things like that. So you will have a bit of numbness at that area. So that is the only two things you would like significantly feel after the treatment. But besides that, of course, you will have pain management depending on what you're doing. Sometimes if you're doing protocols for strengthening, you may have slight fatigue. For at the muscle, just like how you're working out and things like that, when you use the muscle, when you use the machine, and especially higher intensities, you would feel a bit of, of fatigue in the muscle area, but that's completely normal. Yeah. Thank you so much, Audrey, for the very uh, informative answers. So, uh, can, can I just ask one one silly question? <laughs> yeah. Can we use it to uh, instead of going to the gym and working so hard? Can I just apply it and then build up my biceps without going to the gym? <laughs> okay, that's actually a very good question. I always get this question. You, it will work definitely, but you have to continuously do it very consistently because it does give you the contractions, just like how you go to the gym. It does give you the fatigue, the tiredness as you go to the gym. But of course, being a physiotherapist myself, I would say in the end of the day, you still have to exercise and move your body. <laughs> you cannot depend on machines alone. Yes. But it can be an added um, machine to boost the strengthening, boost your muscle. Yes, correct. You can. Good, yeah. good. Thanks. I, I, want, I want to add to Dr. Chan. Yeah. Uh, because like uh, when they have an injury, so I do the strengthening for them. So it, it does work, but we still need the gym. We still need the gym. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because they, when, when you use all these, you're only localizing to one particular muscle. Correct. When, when, they, when, they, co when they do any sporting activity, it's a, yep. it's a combination of muscles and kinetic chain and the whole yes. lot. And also Correct. to increase the load. You want to increase the load. Yeah, so, so I think it, it helps, definitely. There's no question about it. But I think at the end of the day, you're right. We still have to be in the gym, yeah. the hard work, no shortcuts. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> Okay, you have to eat proper food. Yes, yeah. very important. Proper food, proper rest, and a good workout, good program. 
So Mahin, next time uh, you have to give some nutritional advice uh, apart from the physical activities. Yes. Definitely. I, I noticed uh, if I could uh, uh, do some discussion, I was listening and uh, I think Prof Halim have talked about it, uh, therapies and how they're important. I think Ram have talked about the modalities important. I, I guess in the uh, return to play or return to sports, whatever activity you are, I think uh, you need the hand in hand with all the, uh, uh, the sports people, uh, psychologists and these physiotherapists and the nutritionists or dietitians. I think it works. Uh, not single, so what they call a uh, way, it's a multiple way, and you have to work with all these people. And definitely, if you want a diagnostic, you have to go to the physician, you have to get uh, yes. advice on that. And I think the pharmacology side as well, the pharmacy side, the drugs basis that we are using, and sites or any other of these things, I, I guess it's also important. I think we, we may have to think about the team uh, as a team rather than individual uh, per se. I, I, after the exercise, like Ro what Ram have given and everything, they need to rest and everything. They eat, need to eat also because yes. you muscle need the nutrients there. <laughs> You've been kinetically moved up. You, you need some energy to supply and everything. I guess it's all work together and mental health, the psychology part yes. as well. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Chan, we both of us, we go try and then we build up the muscle without doing anything, yeah? Uh, we can't beat as, uh, Austin. La. He, he's got a rip. Yeah, he is. Pack. Uh, I only got one pack. Interesting topic. Yeah, very interesting. Probably next time we will uh, have uh, another session with uh, we combine uh, the ideas and also uh, the, the teams from uh, the sports science as well. So that we yep. can more thorough uh, uh, management in terms of the athletes and also the performance. True, it's very interesting. I, I guess uh, uh, Dr. Halim have given the Prof. Halim have given the whole overview of how the muscles comes to the end and uh, impact of it, and then Rams put it very clinic or they call uh, practical per se. And I think the what Dr. Chan's question is a very layman question, but very, very important question. I think this is where outside people are asking. And uh, I think, uh, and the questions, I think the participants are very good. The, the questions like something like uh, very practical and uh, they really need to apply. They really need to know. And I'm looking forward this kind of machines and more clinical studies to come up. And then as an academic world, that's what we are looking for. Uh, hopefully uh, BTL, uh, to work together with the universities to do more research in local setting and see how it uh, can be used for other sports, not only per, per se, maybe other thing, other uh, modalities, uh, sports uh, implication, uh, psychologically, or even in the biomechanics movement, how the uh, implication to give to the better of the sport, like what uh, Ram said, lah, berhidmat untuk sukan, yeah? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, actually, we have more questions from the participants, but because due to time limits, we have to call this uh, end. So, uh, if let's say if the questions that we didn't answer here, I will actually encourage the participants to actually drop us an email, or you can actually directly email Ram or uh, BTL to uh, ask further re regarding the uh, SIS machines, okay? So um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thanks um, our, to the, to thanks our speaker, Prof Halim, um, Mr. Ram, and also Audrey, and also of course uh, our main collaborator for this webinar, uh, BTL Industrial Malaysia, uh, the director, uh, Ms. Magis, and also, I would like to thank also um, uh, Dr. Chan uh, for uh, for the opening remarks. Probably Dr. Chan want to give uh, some some words for the closing. Yeah, sure. Well, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed uh, this uh, discussion, which is very interesting and stimulating. It is a very good uh, uh, display of basic sciences and its application in the uh, modern world and and how it affects the performance and of the athletes and how you can actually rehabilitate them better. And like Mahan said, it's actually a multi-modal or multidisciplinary uh, effort to get the athletes back into shape. And uh, as, as uh, Alston said, there's also a website and Facebook 
for the Malaysian Association of Sports Medicine, you can always engage us through that uh, sort of platform. And if necessary, you can write directly to BTL or, or Ram himself. Uh, it's also on YouTube. For those listening, you can uh, review the, uh, the session on YouTube and also on our society web page. So please keep in touch, sign up as a member, and hopefully you'll learn lots and, uh, and uh, it'll be all very useful for your guys in, in your clinical practice. All right. Thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a good evening. Yeah, uh, uh, before before we end, okay, uh, I, I will take this opportunity to actually promote uh, our upcoming uh, event, mm. which is the uh, okay. We are having a sport emergency webinar, uh, series one, two, and three. The series one will be on the twenty seventh of March. Uh, we have a very uh, uh, many a wonderful speaker from uh, different fraternities. Uh, the second web webinar on sport emergency will be on 3rd April. And uh, the third one is on 10 April. Uh, I will share this uh, in our Facebook and also uh, I will blast to uh, through emails to all the members and, and also to the Alliance. So I hope uh, you guys will take this opportunity to register as soon as possible because the seat is uh, pretty limited. And, and that's, that's all for today webinar. Thanks uh, for all the participations and also thanks uh, for the overwhelming response from, from the uh, audience. And um, okay, so, uh, so this is the last part for uh, MMA event applications. Um, Please actually claim the CPD points by uh, scanning the QR codes through the MMA event applications, which you can download from uh, Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Uh, and you will get two CPD points by uh, scanning this QR code uh, using the applications. Uh, for e-certificates, uh, we will try to email to all the participants uh, within, one, within this week. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, you really enjoy the, this webinar and we'll continue to support our upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Prof. Dr. Chang. Yeah. Uh, no Dr. Thank you. It's great. Dr. Mahin, Audrey, and Magish. Thank you so much. And all the participants, thank you so much. Good. Great. Nice meeting you all. Nice Congratulations. Meeting you all. A good you. workshop. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye. very much. Great work. Uh, uh, Happy weekend. Happy weekend. And thanks, Alston. Yeah. Great. Bye bye. See bye. you guys. Bye. 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 bye.